morning. It is nine o'clock. And that means it's time for sunrise. Especially because the sun has risen. It has risen, mm. yes. The rain has given us one week of respite. Uh, I don't know about that. Because it rained hippopotamus uh -oh. and elephants in Abuja. Was it two? We're in Lagos. <laughs> and I'm talking about Lagos, where I am at. One week of respite. Is this the August break come early or what? Well, you know that all of the weather has changed. Oh, my God. Look at the heat wave all over Europe, <laughs> all over uh, heard... the UK, America, even Asia. I was having a conversation with a friend. I heard heat wave. Ah. And there is turmoil. Heat wave. It's cooler here. <laughs> really? They're talking about 40 degrees, 42 degrees over there. Even when we have the sun. It's not 40 degrees. Oh, really? No. I think the highest we've done in Lagos area in recent months is 36. It's hot, <laughs> period. <laughs> <laughs> and who says we haven't done 40 before? Not in Lagos. Uh, no, you are not. In Abuja, not. yes. You don't, we don't work with Naimets. <laughs> in Abuja, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, there are those who will argue with you anyway. But long and short, for the man on the street, it's hot. Period. Who is measuring the heat? Well, it's not, it's not hot now. With, with yes, thank, with it's thank not God. hot now. This is rainy season. It's nice and cool. Yes. And a friend of mine who has come from the UK and says, I came to Nigeria to get the sun. And what am I getting? It's hotter over there than here. <laughs> Can you imagine? Jeez. <laughs> well, this whole climate change conversation, I don't know. I sincerely don't know. But the conversation is not just going to end simply because we think. Yeah. Whatever we need to do, we have to do. We have to do. Yeah. We have to listen to all the cops that are going up. COP 21, <laughs> COP 26, all the cops. Yes, 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 yes. Mm. The grid collapsed again. That's one of the cops to listen to. <laughs> the grid collapsed <laughs> yet again. What are we going to do about power supply? Remember that we were told um, earlier that by, the president said that by July 1, something was going to happen and we were going to have more power. Well, July 1 has come and gone and we didn't see any magic. Well, it was actually, I think one of the ministers, was it the minister or one of the agencies in charge of the electricity sector was saying, you know, by July 1, you know, we'll notice something drastic. Maybe it's not July 1 yet, just maybe. And because, you know, there are all kinds of calendars. That I haven't kinds seen of anything and today's the 23rd. Well, maybe it's to upcoming and by the way um the electricity bill we understand has gone through second reading and next is next stop is the public hearing so now what does this bill say well the electricity bill hopefully collapses all of the laws and um, rules and whatever it is we have in you know governing the electricity sector altogether so it's supposed to be one bill that now additionally empowers states to have their to own... To generate. Uh, you know, um, electricity All generation, this centralization whatever. is not working anymore. Okay. Nigeria is, well, it hasn't gone any bigger than it, it, it was before. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the thing is that the population has grown so much. Absolutely. The demand for electricity is not what it was 10 years ago Absolutely. or 20 years ago. And sincerely, if, if the, the um, federal government in when the... When, when the First Republic began, if the federal government and the state government, the Lagos state government, for instance, had mm. agreed, you know, with that, what, what was it then? Is it Omron or something? Enron, yes. Enron, mm -hmm. you know, had mm -hmm. agreed. Yeah. Maybe the kind of uh, power challenges we have in Lagos, being the commercial nerve center of the country, uh, maybe if that agreement had happened, yeah. maybe that challenge wouldn't be so significant in Lagos. But, yeah. of course, there were the laws to contend with mm -hmm. at the time. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, something crossed my mind in the course of the week. Do you know if motorbike riders need any kind, do they go through any kind of test and have any kind of licenses? Which bike riders? You know, we have commercial, and then we have power bikes, we have private owners, we have uh, delivery guys. I know that power bike riders need licenses. Okay. Um, those doing Okadas. And... So long as they are vehicles, they should have licenses. Okay. Maybe, maybe we should ask um, road safety. They should have licenses. I mean, that should be a given. Okay, it was, it was just a thought. It was just a thought. <laughs> you know, 
And uh, this matter of our health sector, um, COVID caught us unawares. Mm -hmm. And it, COVID was a leveler. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter who you were. You just could not leave this country, even if you had all the money in the world. And no matter travel. how advanced you are in the world, it leveled everyone. People died. And I thought, okay, maybe those big men will now realize that COVID is no respecter of persons. Mm -hmm. And if they fall ill, it will still take some time to get them to the airport and fly them to the hospital they want to go to abroad. So maybe now they will see the need to do something about our health sector. But um, have you noticed any difference? Well, I noticed that the vice president had a successful surgery in Lagos. <laughs> Kudos I, that's not to, to the say, vice president. That's not to say medical tourism has ended. But at least the vice president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria mm. treated, had a surgery, a knee surgery in Lagos. And from what we gather, he'll, he'll be up on his feet walking. That's very encouraging, my dear. That's so, very encouraging. So it means that we're gonna, it, it can be done in Nigeria. It can what be many people mm. say is, look, mm. if you travel f in, from Nigeria to whatever part of the world for medical care or whatever... <laughs> Most likely, you will be treated by a Nigerian doctor. <laughs> <laughs> the exodus is also very worry worrisome. The exodus of healthcare workers. Is that new? Hello. It is not new, but it's, it's, it's increasing by no. the day. No, see, if you have a leak and you do not do anything to, to plug block it... it What's going to happen? It's going to get... I've heard about brain drain since, since the Babangida days. Since the Babangida huh. days. And what was biggest at the time? What was biggest at the time was um, ASU strike. Incessant ASU strike. Which we still have. Which we still have. So I'm wondering if we have any plan indeed to do anything about education in the country. Oh, Nigeria, please wake up. Please wake up, my country. I, I, I am I'm, 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 I'm miffed by the fact that we have to talk about <sighs> education in a country where... Look at the quality of people we have in, in, in the National Assembly who have more educated people working under them. There is nothing wrong with that. But a situation where the person who has been elected to do some things doesn't even have the mental capacity to understand the things that the assistance or the support he is getting from the civil service, where, from what I understand, uh, you know, one of them has to operate with a level 16 officer yeah. who, in the federal civil service who must have had eons of years of studies, of education, of training. Trainings. Yeah. of workshops, of seminars, of conferences, both nationally and internationally, and you have, that person is working with you, and the only thing you can think about is what? You know, so, <laughs> and the quality, so we, we're just wondering, what kind of education are we going to get? So it, it's really, really, anyway, where were, where, where were we? Talking about brain drain, right? We were, we were talking about the menu. Okay. Oh, okay, yes, mm, the menu. Mm. Uh, the first one is going to be Nigeria's spending, okay. Here's another one. Nigeria's spending debt more than revenue. That's <laughs> <sighs> recipe for disaster. And from there, we shall, we shall, of course, look at the ASU strike, NLC's planned protests, which we're told is illegal, by the way. Okay. We need to see the laws. Mm. And then how about a look at the startup bill? Um, that's something being considered uh, to help expedite businesses to grow in the country. And this is one that I'm really absolutely going to love. Your food, your medicine. How many oh, people know that? I'm going to love that. I'm, I'm seeing this. Anyway, I'll, I'll talk about that one. Like, I've seen, seen a series titled Human, The World Within. I'm blown away by what I've learned from just watching that series. I'm on episode three already. And you have learned to eat, eat better. No, no, no. I've learned... How important your food is. The quality a of the good food. bacteria that comes from my food. Yes, okay. yes, 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 yes. And then we're going to be closing with the artists of the week. Who's that going to be? She's a she. She's a she. She's a she, yes. Not a shim. She is a she. Not a tomboy. Mm. Okay. 
Don't look at me that way. It's the menu we just done with it. Well, we know you are fine. Don't be too, don't be looking too. We'll be right back. <laughs> enjoy, enjoy the rest of the program. <laughs> is about this debt over revenue issue. Uh, for those who have been following the news, you remember that during the week, uh, the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zain Ahmed, uh, while presenting the 2022 Fiscal Performance Report, said uh, Nigeria's uh, financial position, fiscal uh, position, worsened in the first four months of the year. Uh, the, as a cost of repaying debt surpassed mm. government's revenue in the first quarter of the year, 2022, just to be, to be precise. According to her, Nigeria's uh, total revenues stood at 1.63 trillion naira, <laughs> while debt servicing stood, servicing, not repayment, stood at 1.94 trillion naira, showing uh, a variance of more than 300 billion naira. Do I see red flags? It's the only red flag you're seeing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we kick off this uh, conversation this morning to try to address uh, this worrisome issue. Dr. Ayo Teriba joins us this morning. He's an economist. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. Great to be here. I can see that you are smiling, but I'm not sure that you are smiling on the inside <laughs> because I <laughs> listened to some of your conversation about some of these issues. First of all, let's begin from that revelation by the Minister of um, Finance, Budget and National Planning that we... We earn 1.63. Let me use the street language. We are broke. <laughs> In short. Well, um... Better to say that uh, the revelations by the Honorable Minister makes it seem that we are broke. Uh oh. Yeah. You need uh, to explain this is, that. This is not surprising. We've been on the matter for a few years now. Different well meaning internal and external observers have warned that Nigeria's fiscal situation was approaching a dead end in which declining revenues is one day going to become equal to rising interest payments. So what we've been told by the Honorable Minister is that in the you know, first four months of this year, it wasn't just that interest payments became equal to revenue was that interest payments were more than revenue. We did not have to wait until this point. And the key issue is not that there is a problem. The key issue is what can be done to address the situation. Or rather, are there things that could be done to address that situation, to deal with the declining revenue and deal with the rising, rising interest? But That's the issue. Before it's not you about crying <coughs> over spilled milk. Before you go uh, to those issues, which I know you 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 would need to talk about copiously. We were warned. In other words, that's what you said just now. We were warned. In other we words, warned ourselves. Others warned us. 
we were one. For Whether years. we won ourselves or yeah. others won us, yeah. we were one. Internal. Okay, yes. No, I mean, even I, people that, inside you know, government. You know, I began by saying yes. that this part of things you have been talking about for a while. Yes. What were we doing that made us vulnerable? Okay, uh, vulnerability wasn't about what we did. Our fiscal vulnerability is externally imposed. It comes down pure and simply to what's happening to the price of commodities, particular price of crude oil. That's beyond our control. Because we are largely dependent on that. Regardless, you know, there was one full decade that we prospered on the back of gains in commodity prices, 2005 to 2014. Yeah, so we were dependent on oil, but it made us rich, it made us prosper. The fiscal situation was buoyant. We had buffer stocks, internal and external. You know, the economy grew, inflation was low, interest rates were low, exchange rate was stable. But the tide turned against us in 2014. And we are vulnerable to that. Our revenue is vulnerable to that. So it wasn't an error of commission. It's more in the wake of the collapse of commodity prices, there are things you could do to avoid this. Or could have done. You can do even now. OK, OK. okay. To get out of the fiscal situation. So maybe we are talking about errors of omission. Mm. Once commodity prices fail, the world does not stand at end mm. with commodity prices. Okay. Nigeria is not the only oil exporter. Nigeria is not the only country that is dependent on oil. Mm. Nigeria is not even as dependent on oil as some other countries. And they are thriving. And they are not in this situation. What did they do? Nigeria could have done what they did since 2014, in 2015, 2016. And if we had neglected to do it up to now, we can easily do it now. So, so basically, it's easy mm -hmm. to bewail the situation. But it's more important to say that as you know, seemingly difficult the situation looks, it can easily be resolved. OK, so doctor. Painlessly, quickly. Sustainably. Doctor. So we should spend more time on what is it that the government should do to resolve that situation. Okay. So, Doctor, we are where we are today. Yes. We need to earn more money urgently yes. as a country. Yes. How do we go about that? Where do we start from? Taxation? Okay. Um, let me rule out three illusions that we have about getting money, historically, which the last eight years should have taught us, you know, to overcome. First is that we tended to think, don't worry, oil prices will be back up. So which we, they are. We, we do nothing, we just wait. <laughs> okay? So the last eight years have taught us that, hey, if you continue in that kind of mindset, you are headed for misery, you just impoverish the nation. Mm. So look for alternatives to oil price. Take your mind off oil price. Then we also presume that, well, until oil price comes back up, we can borrow our way out of any difficulty. So now we have borrowed our way into trouble. Now that <laughs> you now <laughs> have no money left after paying interest, so You've, you've huh? borrowed to the extent that interest payment, that revenue is not even enough to pay for interest. Jesus. That to pay interest, you have to borrow. And there's nothing left for any other thing except you borrow. So we should be disillusioned about the promise of debt issued against revenue that you expect, but that will not come. And the third is that, okay, if oil price, oil, oil revenue fails and uh, we can't borrow. We can tax. You can't tax. The economy has been twice, you know, <laughs> it has been in and out of a recession twice in four years. It has endured a pandemic. It's suffering several volts of devaluation. It's unreasonable to expect that any government will get higher tax revenue from such an economy. 
So we should be from an impoverished we should, people. We should overcome our illusions about cheap revenue from oil. Mm -hmm. About yeah, we can always go to China and borrow money. Mm. And about we can always tax. You can't always tax. <clears throat> Many countries right now are giving tax holidays. Mm -hmm. yeah. Many are subsidizing their people. You shouldn't be trying to introduce sugar tax. But, so it's not about tax. It's not about export revenue. It's not about debt. It's not about tax. Nigeria. Yeah, I, w I wanted to. I, I would like us to talk about those solutions, mm -hmm. sincerely. That's what I want to see. But to. two things bug my mind right now, mm. Prof and Dr. Seriba. One of them is that we have been talking about leaks in the system forever. Do you think that if we do these things that you're talking about and begin to earn the revenues, they will not find the same leaks out? Well, you have to, you know, you have to prioritize the issues. Um, when the fiscal situation was buoyant, in the period we refer to 2005 to 2014, yeah. there were leaks, there were leakages. So now it's not primarily about the leakages. You can't fix leakages, but that's secondary. The point is what's a queen into the coffers mm. has diminished considerably. Why I asked that question, my apologies for butting in. I saw a review of the Auditor General's report of 2017 that Serap did. They summed the amount of the amount unaccounted for to the tune of two trillion naira. Oh dear! In one year, and as we speak, I don't know if anyone has been. In other words, to stolen money. Well, they are unaccounted for. <laughs> Maybe not necessarily <laughs> stolen, but unaccounted for. At least you know. So that's the kind of thing that I am talking about. Sir. Before, well, let's let's list the options. Okay. You can now rank them. So if you feel that leakage is the most important, <laughs> number one. I'm, I'm just asking. But let's you are an economist, so I, don't, you... I don't. I can't be quoting Serap figures. Okay. You know, Serap is not. An no, no, no. They, they use this. Uh, yeah. The Auditor General's let's, report. Let's go after more fundamental okay. issues. And the key question is that hey, look, Nigeria is not the only country that has suffered an income shock. Saudi produces five times the oil that we produce. So if oil price revenue shot for hurts, it hurts Saudi more. Yeah. What did they do? Within a year or two, after the commodity prices started weakening, and revenue from oil became doubtful, they didn't, you know, they didn't tax Saudi Arabia. Mm. How many are they? 30 trillion, 40 trillion. <laughs> we have 200, uh, sorry, 30 million. But they turned to their assets. So any government, any company, any individual can get revenue from two sources. From your income statement by producing or trading. Mm -hmm. And if that disappoints, from your balance sheet, from your assets. So Saudi listed 16 sectors of the economy that had always been owned by the government 100% mm. and lined them up for privatization. In that process, they listed Aramco, which today, so as of 2017, when they were doing their uh, long-term plan, a national transformation plan, nobody knew the value of Aramco. Today, that company, that one company, is valued at $2.4 trillion. That one company owned by Saudi is three times as big as Saudi's GDP. And if you own $2.4 trillion on your balance sheet, it doesn't matter if your income is zero. You can unlock liquidity against it. So they, they've been very active in issuing sukuks, globally and locally. So they are not, they are, they, are, they are not even paying interest rate on the Sukuks because mm -hmm. the Sukuks are rated investment rate. The, the, the assets, the underlying assets pay profit. They don't pay interest. Mm -hmm. So Nigeria has far more assets than, than Saudi Arabia. 
You are a 200 million population country, the seventh largest in the world. We have cities, you know, previous history of oil which means that we are littered all over with. I have given an example of one company. Nigeria may not have one company that could potentially be valued at 2.4 trillion. But all the companies that the state owns, perhaps they too will sum up. To sum, but, but we refuse to list them. Now, even we are talking about NMPC. It's going to be listed, but well, somebody tells me mm. it's going to be listed in June 2023. <laughs> you needed to have done it last year. Yeah. Are we together? Mm -hmm. So the options are there. We are undecided. We act as if there's no sense of urgency. We act as if, you know, you know what you could have done in three, six months, you are, you are proposing 10 years. That's why we are in this situation. So you can say that our revenue decline is by choice. It's not that oh, you don't have assets that you can turn to and unlock revenue from. The, you know, if somebody, you know, if a professional <laughs> enters into retirement, it means you've been earning income. If income suddenly drops because you are retiring, mm. you but, turn to your assets. assets. But there are those unlock, unlock them. So you should be going after non-oil, non-debt, non-tax revenue. You, you unlock income from assets. Mm. That's number one, but you, mm. I see no, I, I, I just wanted to, when you, when you talk about unlocking um, income from these assets, that, that you are essentially talking about privatization, am I correct? Not necessarily talking about privatization. Now, privatization is a very small fraction of what we're talking about. Okay. Saudi Arabia listed Aramco. They did an IPO of 1.9%. As you and I speak, Saudi Arabian government still owns 98.01% of Aramco. They did the 1.9% IPO just to establish the market value of the asset. So I, will you say that Aramco has been privatized? No. It's been financialized. That's what they've done. Okay. So all that we are seeing is financialize all state-owned companies too. Mm. By establishing their market value, the difference between a financial asset and a non-financial asset is that the market value of one is known, the market value of the other is not known. So you look at Nigeria's balance sheet. Okay, you look at income statement revenue is falling. You look at our balance sheet. What do we own? Nothing. Because any asset that you own, whose value is not known, it's not going to show up on your balance sheet. Mm. You can imagine how miserable Saudi will be now. Here are $2.4 trillion. Does it suddenly show up on their balance sheet? You know, they access credit market more easily than we could. They are an investment-grade borrower. So the world is not looking at, um, you know, like, we say we take concessional debt. We are, we are looking for donor money. No, that's how it's not looking for donor money. It's offering you a very privileged opportunity to come and invest in assets. And we have more assets than Saudi. But we neglect our assets. We prefer to keep them idle. I mentioned corporate assets. There are also real estate littered all over the country. You can list like 10,000 prime assets, state owned, but they are idle. Mm. I don't even want to mention the barracks, you know, that are located in prime locations, set, which are no longer, you know, best. Suited for military activity, you can't move the city, you can move the barracks. Mm -hmm. And the kind of money that we can unlock if we turn to those real estate assets, we have infrastructure. I'm wondering how that will even play out because um, I remember, was it in 2013, 2014, or thereabout? Well, it, well during the govern Jonathan government, there was an assessment done of abandoned projects in the, in the country belonging to the federal government. And that government, that review must have listed something in the region of 10,000 such abandoned projects. Are, you, are those part of the assets you're talking about? Well, I'm not even talking about abandoned, abandoned projects. When you say abandoned projects, 
yeah, you are still, you know, looking still to menial. government, yeah. something to spend government money on. I'm talking of uneconomic assets. Mm. If you own a parcel of land next to a co Atlantic city, That's the value fine. of one square meter of land mm. there is not going to be too different from the value in a co Atlantic city. And you, the owner of that land, you are poor. You can't even get enough revenue to pay interest on your debt. The risk. And, you, and you keep looking at that asset. I'm not doing Dr. anything. I'm not revenue Dr. From Dr. Okay. Yes. The answer to what you just said now is ouch. <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me bring in uh, Mr. Johnson Chuku, who is MD Curry Asset Management Company. He joins us virtually uh, for this conversation. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chuku, and thanks for joining us uh, this morning. Well, I'm pretty sure you've been listening to Dr. Teriba on this issue of Nigeria spending. We have more debt than revenue. Uh, that's not even the problem. Our debt servicing is lower than our revenue. That would be disturbing to anyone. How, how concerned are you about that? Thank you, Aya, for having me. And thank you, uh, Sister Nero and uh, Dr. Teriba. Um, I'm as concerned as any Nigerian who uh, has a stake in this country. Uh, if you consider the fact that we have, some of us have cried ourselves hooks on this same issue, and we have kept saying that the government should move away from the focus on debt to GDP and focus on debt service to revenue, and that we are eating towards 100% uh, debt service to revenue. Unfortunately, we've gone beyond that. We are now dealing with a situation where our total debt service is now higher than our federal government revenue. Yeah. Uh, the key challenge you have is that if it was a private sector business, it would have been, would have been a big, big mess, a big, big difficulties. Because what that means is that you can't even pay service your interest from the revenue you are generating. Yeah. And the impact is this. The government said they spent 1.26 trillion naira on uh, personnel costs in the first four months of this year. The entire 1.6 billion uh, trillion naira we are borrowed. The government said they spent about 770 billion naira on infrastructure, capital projects. It was entirely borrowed. Plus about 300 billion that was also borrowed to supplement the amount of revenue we earned to be able to pay debt. And that's why the government ended up with about 3 trillion naira of borrowing in the first four months of this year. What that, if you interpolate that, you are going to end up with between 9 and 10 trillion naira of borrowing this year, which will mean that our interest payment obligations will further increase beyond what it is today. So our situation gets, is getting worse by the day because you are not borrowing to even maintain the operation of the government. You are borrowing to supplement what you are earning to pay interest, and you are also borrowing for any capital project. So it's like saying you are in a hole and you are digging further. And if you keep digging for that, what will happen? You will not be able to come out of the hole. So the challenge we have as a country is that how do we uh, adjust the physical framework of the country, the physical structure of the country to minimize the borrowing, possibly grow the revenue? And uh, so we are dealing with two issues. One, we have a major revenue challenge. We also have a cost challenge. How do we manage both ends of the income and expenditure uh, structure to bring down on our expenditure as well as to grow our revenue. And that, that should be the discussion point at this time because it has happened on us. The question is how do we remedy it? How do we come out of this kind of situation? Like okay. I said, we are digging deeper and we need to stop digging. Well, Mr. Chuku, just, just a quick one uh, before I come back to Dr. Teliba to begin to respond because that's, those are some of the things I was to. How do we get out of, out of this rot? But then there, there are those who are wondering, um, why must we, how confident are you of the figures coming from government agencies? Because there are those who are wondering, okay, so the figures are coming from the CBN, the NNPC, the Federal Ministry of uh, Finance, Finance, Budget and National Planning. Do you, are you confident as an economist, as a practitioner, as a private sector person that those figures are as reliable as they come? Well, I may not talk about the exactity of the figures, but they will represent where we are today. And the simple logic is this. Uh, if you look at the report from the Minister of Finance, she said 
our revenue from uh, oil and gas uh, was only 39% of the projected revenue. And logically, if you look at where are the revenues from oil and gas, it's coming from crude sales. Our crude sales, for instance, in the month of May was only, crude production in the month of May was only 1.02 million barrels a day. Um, today, our projected uh, crude production by OPEC, OPEC water is at, for August, is about 1.826 million barrels a day. At best, in the month of June, we produce about 1.2 million barrels a day. So we are far shy of our production quarter. But beyond that, our budget is projected at about 1.8 million barrels a day. So we, you are doing 1 million and your budget is 1.8 million barrels. You are clearly having a major revenue shortfall, despite the fact that we have a growth, a significant growth uh, increase in, in, the, in the price of crude. So we are not able to meet our production quarter. So you have what you call volume variance, negative volume variance, though you have positive price variance. The second to that is that we are importing entire uh, consumption of refined petroleum products. And the price of refined petroleum products have increased. So we are spending more dollars or more expenditure to import that. And the government is subsidizing the landing cost or the pump price of these products. We, from that uh, analysis, mm. we are spending, we're going to spend about 6.2, uh, 6.67 trillion naira subsidizing petroleum products. Some of us have projected this at the beginning of this year when prices moved up. So if you are spending an average of 6 trillion naira subsidizing petroleum products at a period when your total revenue in the first four months was 1.6 trillion, it's no, it's no brainer. That you are certainly, that like I said, if you look at back of the envelope, look at the reality of the country, look at where we are producing crude, look at volume we are producing, and the figures of volume production are coming from third party sources, which are more reliable. We are talking of OPEC, OPEC statements, OPEC report that said Nigeria is producing this quantity of crude. So even if I don't want to rely, if I have any reason to uh, have doubts, on the integrity of data coming from NBS, which I don't have, or the central bank. I also have collaborative figures coming from OPEC, which has no reason to uh, to uh, uh, to adjust Fortify. these figures or mm -hmm. to sex them up. Mm. Well, mm. Dr. Teriba. Dr. Teriba. Oh, thank you very um, much. Let me take you back to where we were before we went to uh, Mr. Chuku. We were talking about how to show up revenue. Um, I want to ask you, how much impact has the increment of VAT from 5% to 7.5 affected that? Has it had any impact at all? See, okay, um, I want to agree with uh, Mr. Chuku. That, before uh, coming here. Yeah, before, yeah <laughs> okay. that uh, we have to deal first with the revenue issue, second with the debt cost issue and I'll one that in an increasing VAT rate from 5% to 7.5% in economics it's not about the tax rate you know you can have a situation in which your tax revenue declines as the tax rate increases oh God. yeah because the higher the tax rate the bigger the incentive for taxpayers to avoid tax. Oh, they just pay, you know, a little more to consultants and they will reclassify spending. They, they'll, cook, away, they'll cook the books. A, no, not cooking the books. Reclassify spending away from the asset that you're taxing. So I can lease instead of buy. You know, so <laughs> if mm -hmm. I bought, I'll mm -hmm. pay VAT. If I lease, I don't pay VAT. Are we together? So it's, yes. it's foolhardy yes. to think that uh, if I increased, I will make more yeah, money. You know, so you, then, yeah, you, you remember your VAT rate, your VAT, you know, the bulk of it is Naira revenue. And, you know, when you have that massive devaluation going on, you know, perennially, we say VAT revenue is higher than the one of last year. That's in Naira. If you adjust for exchange rate, your v, even your VAT revenue is but a very it's small going, fraction. Maybe even going of down. what it was last year or two years ago. Mm. So leave the matter of taxation. You shouldn't be talking about it now. You should be giving tax holidays. You should be giving subsidies. But you want money. So remit. how can you be giving subsidies when you are looking for more you money? You can get money from your assets. 
Well, okay. not, not from taxing anybody's in income is in decline. Economy is in recession. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. So Sherba, you've talked about why do you want to tax an economy that is really the, the base of taxation? Is the income of companies or is the income of individuals? Those are stagnant. Yeah. How do you want to get more tax revenue from declining income okay. base? That's one of the first yeah. things that you've talked about, yes. you know, that we need to um, plunge into our, at least, tap from our assets. That's right. What other things that you, you, yeah. do you think So, to, to unlock revenue, turn to assets. And the beauty of that, you know, if you wanted, if you were still trying to, you know, produce to get income or trade to get income, it takes years. Turn into assets is a matter of months. That's because the assets one. are there. Yeah, you said you, there are three things. The assets are there. Mm. They are idle. Okay. Turn to them. The second one is to reduce debt cost. No. How? We, we, we have to accept that this, our debt management strategy is wrong-headed. All Nigeria's debt portfolio are IOUs or promissory notes. They are all IOUs against future revenue. Earnings. It makes sense to do that 2005 to 2014. When you are sure that when you wake up tomorrow, there is going to be more revenue. Money is coming in. You know, all you need to do <laughs> to get more revenue is go and sleep. By the time you wake up, <laughs> more revenue money is going to <laughs> you, have a, you have a money machine, <laughs> machine. So you can write IOUs and the world will subscribe to your debt. Hmm. Or write promissory notes and you'll be fine. The last time that made sense was 2014, second half of 2014. From July 2014, it didn't make sense. And we keep writing the IOUs. We keep going to the Euro bonds market. We keep going to the FGF against revenue that the whole world now knows are not coming. coming. Are we together? So when your revenue is in doubt, don't issue IOU. So if you want to borrow money, sounds, you can still raise like a, money. Sounds like a no-brainer, right? You can still raise money, mm. but put an asset down. Like a retiree who wants to raise money, you know, put your land down. You have you've owned the land for 20 years, it has been I do. You know, you live in a 20 bedroom no house. house. <laughs> and all the children have gone. Now put those assets down and let people who wish to take the risk invest in those assets. They will give you the cash. It's like leasing your asset. Are we together? So you are going to raise money, you, it's, it's securitized debt. It is like equity. So any cash you raise in the process, you never repay, and you don't have to pay interest. Because if I gave you my you know, property and say, okay, I lease it to you, that's an example, you can have it for 10 years, you give me cash today, you're never going to come back to me to say I should give you the money you gave me. And you are never going to come to me to say I should pay interest. Whether you now recover your profit is your risk. Because you invested. Are we together? <laughs> and I handed over the property to you. you. That's the point. Where I, so whether from the point of view of revenue or from the point of view of debt quality, mm. your asset is what you turn to. Mm. And that's what the Saudis, the Malaysia, the India, of this world, that's what they are doing. Hmm. Everybody is revenue challenged. There is no country that can beat their chest that their revenue is not challenged. Even China and the US, ask why US and China are at, at each other's uh, throats. Yeah, hmm. everybody's revenue challenged, but no one is asset challenged. Hmm. There are only people who know how to turn to assets and those who do not know how to turn to assets. And we are beginning to create the impression. Because the problem that we have on revenue, every country has it. We are beginning to create the impression that our assets are blind spots for us. Oh, Mr. But, Mr. Chuku, at the heart of all this, I'm sorry. It's okay. At the heart of all this is our oil, which has been the cash cow forever. We're not producing enough, which is the reason why we are not making enough money. What can
can we do to ensure that we get enough oil to give us enough money? And if the wells are drying up, there must be other things we can do to raise money. Well, okay. let me use the word that you economists use, revenue. Okay, in the first place, the wells are not drying up. Our negligence as a people over time has made it difficult for us to extract oil from the wells or the fields. Because over time, uh, the people who live in the areas, the oil-bearing communities, have been so neglected that they have no motivation to allow you to come and explore oil in their, in their backyard. And I think that's the core of the problem, which is what the government must address quickly. We must have what we call share of the hearts of the people who live in oil bearing communities. Uh, if you recall, uh, at some point in the life of this administration, they adopted what they called gun, gun strategy, where they wanted to intimidate the, those people in that, or those oil bearing assets to submission, but it didn't work. So, and when they changed the approach and engaged them and had a form of engagement, we began to produce more crude. I think the government has to go back and ask, what exactly do these people want? We need to find some level of compromise between the needs and the demands of the oil communities and the needs of the government. There must be an alignment between our national interests and interests of those who live in places where crude oil and gas is being produced. If we have that alignment, which can be done by engaging the community leaders, the inhabitants of those areas, we will resume crude oil production to the level that we used to have. If we do not have that, we will continue to battle with this. People, if you've been to those areas, you see you can feel and touch poverty, and you can understand the reasons why they are against crude production from their localities. There is no way you will be the uh, geese that lays the golden egg, and you cannot be fed. So we need to engage them, and when we engage them, we are going to have improved production. But let me also emphasize something. Today, countries like Russia that started this crisis is smiling to the bank, because within the period when the war started at, at the end of May, Russia had earned $110 billion of revenue from crude oil production. Russia's crude oil production is about 10, 10 million barrels a day. We should be producing at least 2 million barrels a day. So if you take that in, uh, as a ratio, mm -hmm. we should have earned at the minimum 20, 20 of what Russia's earned. We should be talking about $20 billion. If we had earned $20 billion, we won't be talking about revenue shortfall. We won't be talking of depreciation on local currency. We won't be talking of uh, pressure on our reserve. But because we're not producing, like I said earlier, this country used to produce about 2 million barrels a day. At some point, we're producing 2.2 million barrels a day. Those oil wells are there. The, in terms of our reserve, we have actually increased further. We're not even talking of gas, which actually we will have the Trump card, which currently we're not even producing enough gas to even fire the power plants, talking less of exporting. Let me tell you, Alero, hmm. this country, some more than 20 years ago, started what they call the brass energy, brass liquefied natural gas project. We at the same time started the local uh, liquefied natural gas project. And we also came up with what they call the Trans-Saharan gas pipeline that was supposed to take gas from Niger Delta through the north up to uh, Algeria and then to France and then to supply gas to Europe. Huh. If we had been a serious country, we would have completed these projects. Today, Nigeria should be dancing in as much as we don't wish uh, anybody to suffer an uh, effect of war like Ukraine is suffering. But would I be smiling to the bank and saying, look, our reserve has grown by 40 billion? Again, there's no justification why we should be importing every refined, every liter of refined petroleum product we consume in this country. Because, like I said, we have years of failure as a people at the leadership level, at the governance level, and those of us who should have been agitating more, focusing on the narrative directing the government, uh, putting an operation on the government to do the right things. Mm. And but, this is the result of those failures. Minister, that you could just, just one word, um, one question here. You talked about gas reserves just a little while ago, and one wonders how reliable the oil and gas industry has been so far for us as a country, especially in the light of the fact that everything in that sector is dollarized, not local currency. So how will that play out in our favor, given the exchange rate at this moment? Okay, in the first place, um, if we had the vibrant oil and gas sector, the gas sector, the crude oil sector, today, 
we should be talking of st a strong currency. In fact, the concern now, which is what Russia has, is that its currency is trending so much that its export will become very expensive, and it's trying to take measures to weaken its currency because it has built so much reserve. Uh, and that's the situation which should have found us. If you recall, we, we are talking of, if you recall the go for you win for. That's where we should be today. The well, fact that those products well, are Mr. Chibu, I, I understand, yeah. my, my apologies, my sincere apologies. I understand, you know, where what we ought to have done that we haven't done. And there is something you and uh, Dr. Teriba, you know, decided that we should talk about, and that is what do we do now? So um, he, he, you've listened to uh, Dr. Teriba talk about us turning to assets as a way of liquidating some cash and giving us revenue to balance out some of the challenges that we have on our hands now rather than, as you said, dig our, our, ourselves deeper into a debt that we, will, we may not be able to come out of. What's your take on that one? Well, when we talk of assets, first of all, we have to identify those assets that have current market values. Um, today, uh, if you, aside from our oil and gas assets, because of our political environment, a lot of the uh, real estate assets may not have so much value. Uh, liquidity may not flow into countries or a country like ours where you have high tended security. So let's look at what assets we can liquefy, which is why I, 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 was, I mentioned the aspect of uh, brass LNG and the colloquial LNG. The simple is that they, uh, some of them has got what they call final investment edition. Uh, on them, but investments got stalled. The, the second one has gotten a case, a, proof, a proven case of justifiable investment, but investment got stalled. But now there's a company need to have those investments. If we have a vibrant uh, fiscal or executive arm, we should reach out to Western countries. They are already reaching out to us on the gas pipeline to the trans sahara gas pipeline. They are already reaching out to us. I knew a couple of meetings we had last week to discuss how to bring that, uh, fast forward that project. Okay. And this project, a project that can give us immediate cash flow. We, if we get to the point where investment is coming into those areas, we're going to have immediate cash flow. So that's one, the gas assets and the oil assets are areas we can have immediate cash flow that could cushion our current challenge. When Dr. Teriba was talking about selling assets, um, if you look at the real estate assets, that, those ones may be difficult because they are, will be exposed to only Nigerian investors. Nigerian investors may not be so keen on buying into. Uh, they may not have even have the liquidity to buy so much of those assets. Um, and they are, when you talk of asset sale, you also bear in mind that asset sale is a one-off uh, cash flow. It doesn't give you continuous uh, revenue. And that's, for me, the focus should be, let's get the brass LNG working. Today, we earn a lot of dividend from uh, the uh, existing LNG, the general LNG, the one in Bonnet. We can replicate that into three or four places. Okay. And that will help us grow our revenue. Dr. Terba, you want to quickly respond to that? Yes, let me, yeah, uh, Mr. Chuku. Um, well, you can believe that uh, digging more oil wells or, you know, building more gas plants, I don't share that belief uh, to the extent that you can't compare Nigeria with Russia. Nigeria, Russia, the value added by Russia to Russia's oil output is not the same as the value added by Nigeria to Nigeria's oil output. We have so, no value added. So, so you dig the oil, you get the gas. Question is, how much value are you retaining? Who owns the technology? And who owns, you know, the distribution? So I won't go there. It's a mirage. There's no path forward there. Then what I said about assets, I do not, you know, I want to correct the impression. It, it, uh, Mr. Juku is entitled to his views. But Dubai thrives on real estate, not oil. Are we together? Yeah, so but if, if, if real, hang on, let me learn. Okay. I'm not saying sell real estate because he has said, Selling is a one or thing. Mm. I said lease. Okay? I said free government-owned land that currently generates zero revenue for exploitation for commercial purposes has to begin to earn revenue from the never sell. I said, I'm not talking privatization. I'm talking financialization of your asset. Establish their values. You know, UK... Recently relocated about a dozen prisons from inner cities. They relocated all inner city prisons. 
that it makes no sense to keep a prison in the center city of the center. city. In time commercial center. So they relocated them and repurposed and redeveloped them. You now for commercial activities, it could be residential, it could be shopping. Mm. That's how you unlock real estate. Mm. That's, there is no global financial center that isn't thriving based on real estate. Mm. I, mean, I say that you know, only Nigerians will buy real estate. I have met real estate uh, companies at airport lobbies around Nigeria asking me to come and buy real estate in, in Dubai. Dubai. Yeah. So why would we now say that uh, how many people are in Dubai compared mm. to the population of Nigeria? But, yeah, but, 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 so but, please, but doctor, okay. please, you can, you, can, you can financialize your corporate assets. I gave that example of Aramco. We also have companies. We don't know the market value of any of our companies. Not even an NPC. None. Well, we hope we will know by <laughs> June 2023. That's what the government has told us. Oh, yeah. But we needed to know it yesterday. Yeah, but, 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 but doctor, when you're talking about leasing, also factor in the issue of insecurity in Nigeria yeah. at the moment. See, the people will not be, I mean, you, you, you can't go and start trading real estate in Dubai, for instance, and inviting them to come and buy real estate in Nigeria. Because they're going to tell you what, let's with not all that's put going the on. Cat, wait, let's not put the cat before the house. Today, we talk about insecurity. But there are Secure spaces. Where? Very good. Now, hoodlums are a threat to you in common places, in public places. Mm -hmm. In so many private residential areas now, they are secure. So, in many, you know, gated residential areas, shops open 24 hours here in Lagos. Are we together? Really? When you enter the confines of a five-star hotel, you are safe, your property is safe. When you enter a, a mall, you are safe, your property is safe. It's when you step out of that mall. So wait, it's, so the point is that if you know that there is a treasure sitting there, you will secure it. You can't you know, go and put bullion you know, in, in a, a building and not secure it. So the fact that we neglect to seek, security is preventive. You know, it's too late to cry when the head is off. And it's about surveillance, it's not policing. It's not trying to go and investigate and bring anybody to. It's to prevent the commission. Are we together? So that's the difference between Dubai and us. Dubai appreciates the asset value of their city. They appreciate the asset value of their city centers. Largest, you know, number of air travelers. What's the size of the population? Look at Saudi Arabia. If there is news, you know, that people can just be kidnapped in Saudi Arabia, it destroys, you know, their, their, their pilgrim business. Are we together? Mm. So if it's important to you, you will secure it. You can't tell me that who is happy to hear news about, you know, traffic robbery or, you know, harassment uh, in the deserts or... What the bandits coming out, you know, but you can secure all those spaces. Yeah. Other countries have bigger expanse of land. Saudi is twice as big as Nigeria, they secure their space. So until the government recognizes that it is those assets that hold the key to our posterity and therefore, you know, have an incentive to secure it. I'm sorry, we won't start. We'll be talking about going looking for this income, looking for that income, yeah. looking for that task. <laughs> Whereas the answer is under the nose. Assets. How about, do, do we have other fiscal um, instruments? You, you've spoken about this asset thing quite copiously and uh, a sizable number of people who are reasoning the way you do uh, will agree with you largely and of course you've also debunked the concern about insecurity. I, I know that Mr. Chikumi wanted to speak to that earlier but are there other fiscal instruments that or, or steps that have been taken over time that we need to review. You've talked about the, our, our, our debt profile also that needs some editing. Are there other fiscal instruments within you know, the system that need some work to help us manage our resources? There are those who are talking about the, the top heaviness of the finances of the federal government. 
for instance. Top heaviness. As, like, you know, the, the, the government spends too much. They need to cut down on their spending. Well, um, the situation we find ourselves now, in which once you, you can't, that the revenue that comes in is not even enough to pay interest on debt. So your first priority, how to get revenue. You can be debating how to spend. You don't even have any revenue to spend now. <laughs> Unless you borrow. This is sad. Right? <laughs> Next, the debt cost doesn't have to be so high. I look at the debt stock of Malaysia, much smaller country by population and by GDP, bigger debt than Nigeria. Their debt service rate, maybe 6%. Hours, 12 percent. So we need to do something about that. We need to start thinking of in our debt portfolio, we have zero percent that is investment grade. And in those countries I'm referring to, the bulk of their debt are rated AA by leading Rating agencies. Rating agencies. Mm. So we need to look at that. We cannot be doing things wrong. Mm. So the penalty we are paying for the 1.9 trillion in interest cost is inefficiency, the failure of debt management. Mm. That, that the debt cost doesn't have to be that high. Well, we, we increase the quality of the debt and you can save Nigeria's money. Honestly, hearing about the quality of debt, just wondering. <laughs> well, Mr. Chico, we have to close now. What would be your own immediate recommendations that we should, steps that we should take immediately to begin to uh, tackle this issue? Okay, let's start from the cost aspect. Um, one of the areas that the government is carrying a huge cost is on subsidy. Uh, the first thing we need to do is we have to introduce some level of modulation in the price of petroleum products, which means we will adjust the price upwards marginally at regular intervals. When we do that, we're going to make it difficult for the volume that is going to neighboring countries. And if you reduce the volume is going to neighboring countries, the amount the government is paying on subsidy will reduce, which means government expenditure will go down. Uh, the other aspect on the income side is to look at where government can... Uh, let me also add a second aspect to the expense side. The government said it spent about 770 billion naira in the first four months on capital expenditure. By now, the government's focus should be to bring in private capital into critical and commercially viable infrastructure so that government only focuses on social infrastructure. That way, we're going to free up that 770 billion that was spent on infrastructure. We're still going to have the infrastructure once we can concession them. And we have proof of concept. The telecommunications, the government spends no cover to build telecommunication infrastructure today, and government is still making money, and we have the infrastructure. Then on the revenue side, the areas that the government should look at, we have already introduced VAT, which is a burden on consumption. Um, I had talked about um, the aspect of improving on crude production, which is, the, for me, is a short-term solution to part of the revenue problem. Okay. Uh, if, if, uh, but before I go, I also need to mention something. Today, our cost of fund, our cost of credit, is actually highly subsidized. If you look at our total debt of our hundred billion dollars, forty billion of that is foreign currency debt. The forty of the forty billion foreign currency debt, about fifteen billion are commercial debt. The rates are highly concessionary rates, whose rates interest are about one percent, one point five percent, two percent. The on the uh, on the local currency debt side, the government is actually paying sub market rate because the central bank has intentionally keeping kept interest rates low. If the government was to pay commercial rates our interest service will be some in the region of three trillion naira. So it's not necessarily the structure of the debt as a problem. It's the fact that the size has to okay. command certain minimum cost. Okay. And uh, well, my sincere apologies, uh, Mr. Chuku. I think it, it, this is looking like we need a symposium on economics <laughs> because it even sounds to me like one plus one in economics is not just when you have to discuss the first one and you have to discuss the second one to come up with the answer. But that's not for today. Johnson Juku, MD Kari Asset Management Company, thank you so much for your time this morning. My pleasure. And Dr. Ayotariba, I don't know.
we can't finish this conversation <laughs> today. We have to thank you very much for, for your time this thank morning. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julia. I appreciate your time. So, where do we go from here? Well, as we always say here, every conversation is a conversation starter. And that's that about Nigeria spending. And so many issues are coming up from left, right, and center, perhaps in your own mind as well. Let's continue with that subsequently. But for now, we'll take a break and another conversation subsequently. Stay with us. Thus, you must have heard uh, in the course of the week that the federal government has appealed to the NLC, Nigeria Labour Congress, to cancel its planned protest uh, in support of the prolonged strike by the Academic Staff Union of Universities and other university-based unions. The Minister of Information did actually describe the proposed action as unlawful. Well... We're going to be looking at this this morning with uh, the head of international relations and liaison to the National Assembly. National Labour Congress, Honorable Comrade Uchenna Ekwe. Good morning, Honorable. Good morning. Are you with us? <laughs> Good morning, comrade. Is it possible for Honorable to unmute? Honorable, could you please unmute your mic? Hello? Can you hear yes. us now? Hello? Hello Are you there, comrade? We can hear you now, sort of. Yes, I'm with you. Great. Thank you for joining us. Are you I'm hearing you. Great, great, great. Thank you for joining us. Thank now, you. Now, so um, what is the situation now? The minister says that your planned action is unlawful. So is this protest holding or not? <laughs> well, I, I don't know where the uh, minister is uh, driving his own... Oh, dear. We're having problems with audio there. Oh, from uh, expression. Hello? Well, we can hear you, um, uh, Mr. So, Honorable. Uh, Comrade, we can hear you, but uh, the, the line isn't very, very friendly. Um, you'd allow us to... We'll, we'll come back to you in a bit, but let's uh, have a, you know, further this same conversation with Javier Bola or Yarino, who is a public affairs, a researcher and public affairs analyst. Thanks for joining us this morning, uh, Dr. Yarino. Well, all of this conversation between the federal government and labor, it would seem like... I don't know. First of all, uh, let's begin with that comment coming from the Minister of uh, Information that uh, the planned protest is unlawful. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I do not uh, know the constitution where the Minister of Information uh, is drawing his assertion from, but uh, it will amount to... Uh, the understanding of how the ruling class uh, sees the proletariat in which um, they, they, they govern. Uh, it is uh, appalling to um, decipher in a democratic system to say a, 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 pressure, a pressure group like uh, the NLC uh, that they do not have a right to protest uh, in whatever peaceful means that they choose to. And uh, the, the, the NLC is a pressure group, who, uh, by far the strongest in the country. And um, they will pick issues based on interest. 
And I tell you that it is based on the interest of NLC to see that ASU works. Because I would say this is the final lap to the total collapse of, of the public university system in the country. And I do believe that the bulk of the people who constitute those who attend these universities come from the rank and file of those who make up the NLC. Uh, their kids go to, to, to these universities, so they have vested interest in ensuring that the university system works. Uh, it is evident that the federal government is playing a game of, I am bigger than you, I am stronger than you, uh, with ASU. And ASU equally haven't coordinated themselves in, in, in the best way possible, uh, using other means that pressure group you know, devised to achieve their purpose. But now ASU is com um, NLC is coming to salvage the situation as it were, because they have a stronger force. The federal government cannot afford to allow the NLC go for, or go on strike for four months. The, the economy will collapse. So that's one very good way to, to bend the federal government to ensure that it do the bidding of, of ASU because it is the right thing to do. King, isn't ASU one of the children of the NLC? Of course. ASU is, should be an, uh, a branch of, of NLC. And in that regard, uh, they, they, the, NS, the NLC should actually uh, uh, you know, be in solidarity with ASU. And that is exactly what they're doing. Unfortunately, it has taken four months, four months of um, students' life who they cannot, that four months that they cannot have back, you know. But I do believe that uh, synergy like this, you know, in the future will, uh, you know, play a major role in helping to uh, uh, ensure that the crop of leaders that we have do the bidding of the people, because it is evident that the federal government acts as if uh, the, the, the power doesn't come from the people. They only pick issues that they want to address. You remember when the aviation sector, uh, the airlines uh, uh, opted to go on strike. Uh, you saw the quick response in which uh, the federal government uh, answered them and the issues were resolved. But ASU has been a recurring issue and there seems to be no solution in sight. So there's a need to, for ASU to pull, to work with associations that you know, share common interests so they can compel the ruling class that do not understand where the real power comes from. Because, I mean, this is months to an election. The ruling party hopes to come back to power, and they, 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 they've locked students out of school for four months. I do, I do not know any country where uh, the, the government of the day have so much confidence that they will return to power without doing the bidding of the people. But, I mean, this is Nigeria. Anything can happen. <laughs> that, I don't like that expression. <laughs> I don't like it at all. But let me bring in uh, Comrade Ekwe here, Comrade Uchenna Ekwe. Well, I'll go back to the first question I asked you, which uh, you couldn't answer because you were still in transit at the time, but we, were, we, we couldn't hear you. So now that government says that the action is unlawful, what's going to happen? Well, the action is not unlawful. Uh, the Minister for Information does not have a separate constitution. The freedom of expression is clearly enshrined in our constitution, and I don't think anybody needs to waste energy <coughs> in bothering about what the Minister for Information said. Like the earlier speaker really mentioned, uh, it exposes the, the mindset and attitude of certain sections of the ruling class. Here we are discussing that over five months, uh, students have been at home, and uh, we are talking about calling attention of the authority to deal with it. And the only thing a Minister of Information can offer was to start an attempt to remove the gains of democratic process. If we can, even under the military regime, do protests to call attention of the military regime, that's not a democratic government. 
at a full-fledged democratic system and somebody is suggesting that a protest is unlawful. It's rather embarrassing. And I think the Minister of Information should feel embarrassed that he made such statements. So, so comrade, what you are saying in effect is that this protest is still going on? Of course. The protest is still going on. The protest is just a warning, a, 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 a notice that uh, a call for attention that this strikes and may I use this opportunity to clarify, that is the entire education institution unions that are on strike. It's not just us. The non-academic staff union of universities are on strike. The senior staff association of Nigerian universities are on strike. The technologists, uh, the NAT union in the university, are on strike. The entire system of federal institutions, universities, are shut down. And I expect that any sensible person, not just in government, should be worried for the country, that we are keeping away our young ones, the ones who claim holds the future of the country at home for five to six months. It should be embarrassing. It should be a collective embarrassment mm. to us as a nation. And to say the least, uh, a minister's suggestion is, so the, strike, the, the protest is going on as a warning that if nothing happens, we have no choice than to call a national strike. Hmm. Well, Dr. Yarino, you operate within uh, a university environment. Perhaps you want to give Nigerians an idea. Well, I don't even know how to. I, with, with the, without intending to put you on the spot, you know, uh, perhaps you want to give Nigerians an understanding of exactly what we are dealing with here, especially when we talk about the university system, um, going by what uh, Comrade Ekwe has, has said, you know, about, you know, the, the university system. What is the understanding that you want Nigerians to have? And why should those who need to do something urgently do it, not just in the interest of now, but in the, in the interest of the future? Uh, thank you. Um, I would start by saying that uh, the, the entire structure that we currently have is, is fault, uh, starting with the, uh, the amount a, an average lecturer, you know, will take home as, as his pay. These are uh, uh, where the challenges starts from because you see a, a university lecturer that has spent an average of 12 years to get a PhD degree, earning the same salary that um, um, a company clerk will earn. Who views such a structure? Um, it's, it's a lopsided structure. And I also tell you for free, for a lecturer to get promoted uh, within the system, he still spends from his personal money, and you expect quality research. Um, you cannot give what you do not have. Uh, the educational academic environment is expensive. Uh, if, to move uh, through the ladder, you have to publish in learned journals, and it has to be self-sponsored. Uh, sometimes you get grants, Sometimes you, you, you get intervention from foreign, foreign donors and all of that. But how far can that go? This is why you have found out that there is a, a huge migration of uh, uh, people with uh, uh, the, the intellectual capacity mm. to educate the coming generation. They are living in, in, in droves. So the challenge is... The university system is at the brink of a collapse. If we do not intervene on time, there will be a problem. Now, There's a solution. Okay. I would like to spend a uh, few minutes to discuss the solution. We'll get there, uh, Dr. Okay. Yarino. We'll get to that point. But, you know, another, you know, uh, element that I'd like you to speak to um, is, or if you want, confirm, what Comrade Ekwe said that every 
every sector, every operati or operational sector in the university system largely are on strike. Can you confirm that is true? That is, that is the true situation of things. The university, uh, federal universities yeah. across the country are, you know, in a state of comatose. Nothing is happening. Um, Nasu, Sanu, Asu, they have, they have all down to their tools. Okay. And, uh, all right, so uh, let, me, let me come back to, you know, Comrade Ekwe. So, Comrade Ekwe, for those who are looking at you and listening to you now, what is the essence of this strike? It's gone on for months, even before this five-month-old strike. There was a strike before ASU uh, changed leadership from uh, Professor, you know, Biodun Ogunyemi, I think, to Professor Shedeke now. There was a strike that was called off when this new uh, administration of ASU came on. And now uh, they said, OK, you know, let's have this, let's call off the strike, have some conversation, and it will seem like this is where we still are. For you, what have you heard? What are the outstanding issues? Because uh, at various levels, we hear all kinds of things from the presidency, from the Minister of Education, from the Minister of Labor. What are the facts on ground that might be able to mitigate this protest? Yeah. The, you know, as you like rightly traced, uh, gave that opportunity, window, uh, for renegotiation of an, uh, past agreements to fix the issues, include fixing of wages, uh, dealing with end allowances, uh, funding of universities. Like the doctor have said, uh, a, a university cannot function without research. Here, research institutions are not funded research are not funded. Uh, you have lecture rooms where you have up to 200 students using one lecture hall. And uh, even master's degree students having up to 50 to 60 people in a room. And all these things doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. So, uh, and all these, comrade, as we have brought on the table, yeah. Comrade. On how to, they yeah. brought suggestions. Yes. On now, even how to. How, those, those conversations have been going on, but what, how does this protest intend to change anything? How do you think this protest will change anything? Yeah. How, it, how we think it will change something is that now that the system feels they can, because that's the, that's the feeling. Uh, they, they, they are almost ignoring the institutions. They, they, there seem to not be serious commitment to resolving this. And now we have to pull uh, the, uh, our instrument of what we call injury to one, injury to all. What we intend to do is to use the solidarity from other sections, other workplaces, to say, look, we are in solidarity and we need this thing to be resolved mm -hmm. for the interest of our families, because our families are involved, for the interest of the workers in the university system. Our belief is that this will allow people in the system know that this they cannot any longer play ostrich on this negotiation that this negotiation must be dealt with and finished because there is nothing difficult in dealing with this matter. What is lacking is commitment of those in leadership to resolving it. Now that we're not seeing that commitment, we're now being forced to give a solidarity demonstration as a warning step Step one warning that if this matter is not resolved, we'll get the entire working people in all the industries to shut down to make sure that this matter is resolved. But, but comrade, um, ASU, from what we gather, is not, is not ready to accept any more promises from government. 
And if you watched, if you listened to us earlier today, you will understand that clearly government, or should I say Nigeria, Nigeria is in dire straits right now. We are broke. So if government says it doesn't have any money, we can see that it doesn't have any money. So if it says, okay, you guys, take X amount now. We are going to promise you that by this, this date, we're going to pay you the balance. I know that they have said this many times before, and they did not keep to their word. Do you think that ASU would accept promises again? Yeah, maybe, maybe I delve a bit into the not having fund. Uh, uh, you in the studio, uh, the journalist, uh, who is carrying out this interview, if you get home and tell the members of your family, uh, look, we, we are running into a problem, we don't have money. Uh, we used to eat three times a day, now we have to eat once a day. And the family members say, okay, uh, mom or dad, it makes sense, we'll start eating once a day. And they agreed, and they ate only the afternoon. Only for them to come out in the evening and see you in a beer panel, drinking beer, <laughs> eating pepper soup. Do you think it will work tomorrow? When you come home tomorrow and say, we'll eat once, nobody will listen to you. That family, that agreement will be broken. We are made to believe that we don't have money. Let's face it. The monies collected from the two major parties, from people who run election for forms, the money they used in buying forms, the one term is known, put it side by side by the money that is needed to get the university working. How do you convince people that the ruling class that they were that was paying delegates twenty thousand dollars, thirty thousand oh dollars, will convince a people that there is no money to fund education. Let's get serious here. People won't believe those theories. People will not, because the attitude and behavior does not say that that's the true situation. Where the ruling class brazenly spend such humongous amount of money, especially the two leading parties, and we all saw the money being spent. Nobody has ever denied it. It is known, it's on record. And if we add up the money, vis-a-vis -vis the money needed to resolve the education crisis, and these are people who are ruling, and you tell the people there is no money. People will need to see seriousness and commitment. That's why I took it from the family perspective. If a father comes home and tells the children, we're having crisis, we don't have enough money, we're going to eat once a day, and the children agrees only to see their father in a beer parlor, <laughs> drinking Hennessy, drinking beer, drinking pepper soup, I can't, I can't fault you. The amount involved would have fed them three times in a day. I can't fault take you. It? I can't fault you, comrade. I think at this point I give up. <laughs> I can't fault you there. Oh, we, I don't know. I don't know. Well, you're the one that's going to have to sign them up because you have to go now. But when, when he raised that one, I'm just saying, look, ah. for, for a dad, for instance, who is in this place, he could, so a friend could have bought it for him. I don't know. I mean, it's possible. Mm. I know when you argue that, I mean... I can't, for, I can't fault you there, comrade. <laughs> you win. <laughs> Com comrade Uchenna Ekwe. If somebody, if somebody bought it for the dad, the dad, the dad would have said, please, my children have not eaten. He will carry it home. He beer. will carry it home to his uh, children. The money for five. I, I wonder yes. what Dr. Yarino thinks of that one before we close. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, are you there? <laughs> Can you hear me? I said, I wonder what you think of that, that analogy. Uh, I mean, I was, I was basically <laughs> smiling from here. And, and that's a true situation of things. You don't tell me you do not have money to fund education when I see how lavish you live. We had promises from the ruling party. But don't, party. Forget, don't forget that there is federal government money and then there is private money. 
Well, I mean, we know where this money is coming from. I oh, mean, really? Know. Well, you're a researcher. You would know what I don't, but our time is up for oh, now. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Abimbola Oyari, no researcher and public affairs analyst who joined us via Zoom, as well as Honorable Comrade Uchenna Ekwe, head international relations, also liaison to the National Assembly, NLC. Thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, we pray that uh, NLC does not get, get into any trouble by going ahead with this protest. Good luck. Sunrise will return in just a moment. Please stay with us. Okay, it's time for us to uh, talk about what now? Your food, your medicine. Both of them cost money. Well, I think the food is cheaper. Depending on which village you are listening to. <laughs> well, the food is certainly cheaper. I mean, I know how much my drugs for hypertension cost me. Ah, well. Fact there, but then don't also forget that we're hearing this conversation about bread makers going on strike. Well. Anyway, we'll, we'll come to that. Yeah. <laughs> Research shows that dietary habits influence disease risk. While certain foods may trigger chronic health conditions, others offer strong medicinal and protective qualities. This is the reason more attention is to be given to what we eat. I, I told you earlier that I I'm watching this um, series on Netflix, Human, Human yes. The World Within. I've, I'm blown away by what I have seen so far. And let's just begin this conversation with uh, Dr. Bisola Kadiko, who is a naturopath and MD, Nature Can Fix You Clinic. Thanks for joining us this morning. Good morning. Nature Can Fix You. I love that name. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Particularly since I always hear that everything you need to live a normal life, a happy life, you can find in nature. Yes. Just know where to go to get it. Mm -hmm. The same way that everything you need to cure any ailment in this body is in nature somewhere. Mm. And is so, that true, by the way? Uh -huh. Yes, it is true. You're very correct. Okay, it's not a myth then. Right. No, it's not a myth. <laughs> okay. So, nature is complete. Okay. Complete. Mm -hmm. So I want to be able to eat well and see the doctor. I'm not going to say my doctor because I, if I had been eating well from beginning, wouldn't I wouldn't have anyone. my doctor. So I want to eat well so that I don't go to the doctor. And I'm talking about from when I am this high. Give me a kind of regime that I need to follow. Very good. You see... Um... Just like you said, you don't want to have to see your doctor. No. And that is what uh, doctors of natural medicine, that's what they aim. Many times when patients come to my clinic, I tell them, um, you know, um, I'm hoping that in the next six months, we don't have to see you anymore. And they go like, oh, but I'm hypertensive. I'm diabetic that um, I've been taking drugs for the past 20 years sometimes, and I'm still seeing my doctor. I said, it's different here. You see, what nature gives you is, just like I said, complete. Now, what do you need to eat? Or what do you need to stay off from mm -hmm. for you to have a very... Um, to have sound health. Do doctor free life. Doctor free life. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, but you will not uh, allow us to stay in business. <laughs> well, okay. You, you, you too, your aim is to make sure that you reduce it as much as possible, uh, right? Yes, yes, of Good. course. Of so course. we want you to reduce it to the minimum. Yes. So the first thing I always tell people, stay off processed foods. And they're like, what are processed foods? You know, they Google, they crack their heads. And I say, just wait, just hold on. Think about this, farm to table, farm to table foods. And they go like, ah, oh, yes, so let's go over it. 
Let's do it. Let's do this, uh, this short farm exercise. To farm to table. Mm. Tell me. Tell me one farm to table food. Yum. Good. Vegetables. Good. <laughs> Eggs. All of a sudden, we're answering questions. <laughs> <laughs> our, our job is to how ask. About, how about Don't bread? Don't turn the table. All right, okay. How about bread? It's not. It's not. Um, how about uh, spaghetti? No. Noodles? No. Pizza? No. Okay, Ooh, how, so take it off. Certainly not. <laughs> uh, excuse me. Uh, slow down. Yeah, yeah. Thank that's, you. That's, well, it's that's a Saturday sure. morning. It's mm -hmm. family day. We're going to take children out. Mm. Somewhere. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry about that. But seriously, reduce it. Just reduce, stick, not uh, not stick stop. to farm to table. And yeah, then you have about, less just, just a second. Some how, people how are going to say farm to table oh, oh, oh. is not too tasty now. Right. We need a bit of pizza my from young, time my to time. My yam is tasty. My potatoes are tasty. A little hamburger. My herba is tasty. My chickpeas is tasty. How about those uh, vegetables, packed vegetables? Are they processed? Would you classify them as processed? What do you mean? The ones that, you know, you go to the supermarkets, you see them, they're, they're all, you know, pre, they're, pro, they're packaged. No, they're, not, processed. they're not processed. Okay, those, those yeah, are Yeah, I mean, they're just making life easy for you by helping you cut them up. Okay. You and know? wash them. Yeah, and yeah. wash them. You know that you said that bar, you know, is farm to table, but yes, don't forget is. that Gary is also processed. processed. No, what kind of processing? Well, it is processed. Is that any preservative, any additives? No, no, no. That's, that's, now, that's now stepping no, it up. No, 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 no. You see, um, okay, if, if you want to say that, then you say don't eat um, palm oil, don't eat um, granite oil. And these are the oils that we approve of. Because it's a cold pressed. Yeah, I mean, food has to be processed to a particular point mm, for mm. you to be able to eat it. You can't eat raw cassava. Raw cassava will kill you outrightly. So it has to be processed. You can't eat raw cassava. No, 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 you can't eat raw cassava. Okay, if that one is boiled. Exactly. The one that you see them in exactly. slices that yeah. they sell with coconut. Yes. Okay. It's and boiled. you know, these okay. traditional people that boil it, they know how to process it to so a mm. point where your body can digest it. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, beyond that, doing, adding anything to it, uh, making it uh, more uh, 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 beautiful, nice for you to eat, you mm. know, like all the processed meats, the salamis mm. and the bacons and all that. I was just reading something up, you know, somebody wrote something to me and was asking me about his meats. Because I told him that, yes, you can continue eating your red meat because um, he's one of my patients. I checked him. There's no reason why he shouldn't eat lean meat. And he was asking me, how about salami? How about uh, bacon? How about cold cuts? And I was like, no, these are processed meats. And I had to explain it to him. So mm -hmm. stay off processed meats. You, you, ah. You're talking about meat. Okay. Mm -hmm. Forgive me. Mm -hmm. I have to go there. Mm -hmm. We've heard all these kinds of, uh, all these things about eat meat and uh, cancer and all those things. Um, if you eat, you, you may have heard it before as well, that if you eat certain kinds of meat, uh, if you eat meat, you're going to have cancer or it's, it's not good for you at certain age grades. I don't mm, understand. Red, what. red meat. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure you read it up on Google. <laughs> <laughs> Google is our competitors. All doctors, conventional, natural, they are, they are, they are our competitors, you know. Um, you see, cold meats, like cold cuts and processed meats, are the ones they're talking about. Lean meats are safe, especially in this part of the world where our cows are allowed to graze. As long Natural as you allow grass. the cats to graze, okay. <laughs> please allow the cats, the, the, the cows, cows to graze. It's very important. You know, um, I don't want to go into politics, but I always but keep quiet. They don't quiet. have to be open <laughs> What's important is that they graze. Let them graze, In other words, please. let them eat grass. 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 Okay. You know, 
So, um, yes, as, as long as our cows are allowed to do that and eat natural foods, you don't confine them in some, uh, some farm where you give them artificial food and change the DNA, mm. you know. Um, yes, our meats are safe. You can eat red meat if you don't have any problem with your heart, if you don't have uh, cancer, if you don't have certain uh, ailments. Yes, if you see your doctor of natural medicine, <coughs> they'll tell you that you can eat lean meat. Okay, you mentioned palm oil earlier. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, I mean, the shouts about <laughs> palm oil is very bad for you, it's this, it's that. And then some years later, the same you guys <laughs> told us, ooh, palm oil is the best thing since sliced bread. Mm. In fact, at one point, I remember reading that you can take one dessert spoon of palm oil every day and it will help your body. Please, what is the true position <laughs> about palm oil? All right, let me you. just clear one thing. Yes. Um, and patients come to my clinic and they tell me, Oh, I stopped eating this because uh, my doctor told me to stop eating it. Mm -hmm. Or my friend or my colleague told me, oh, it's, it's bad for you. Mm -hmm. and, that, and I always ask them that, who is this person that told you to stop eating it? Uh, did you ask for this person's qualification in nutrition? You know, and I said, just, and, and I always tell them, just look behind you. That's my qualification from one of the best nutritional institutes in the world that I attended. So when I talk to you, I am authority talking. So you see, um, yes, I don't know what you mean by you guys. <laughs> we <Doctors>. guys, <laughs> no, 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 you see, see, who is the doctor? Uh, you know, a conventional doctor can really not talk about nutrition. They have no right to talk about nutrition because um, they cannot tell me they spent more than seven hours of lecture on nutrition in their seven years of medical study. Mm -hmm. So we, natural, we doctors of natural medicine are the ones that are qualified to talk about nutrition. Mm. And we have never shifted from this fact that palm oil is one of the best oils to eat because it is cold processed, just like granite oil, just like coconut oil, just like olive oil. These are the four kinds of oils that you will find in my kitchen. No hydrogenated oils. What is, um, what, give, give me an, give us an example of a hydrogenated oil. Soya oil. Don't let me speak too much because the <laughs> manufacturers are also watching canola oil ah, okay. and all that. Okay. They're all hydrogenated oils. How, how about this? Um, so you, you, okay, we'll be going back and forth, you know. Anyone that she picks, she comes back to. Anyone I pick, I come back to. So you talked about, you know, grass the other time. And one of the ways, unfortunately, that farmers have had to protect, if I can use the term, their produce sometimes is to use pesticides and all those things. Uh, in the event that, you know, a farm has, well, is protected with pesticides, how much of an effect does that have on the quality of meat that comes from cattle? Well, I don't know if uh, they spray pesticides on just grass. Okay. It's a farm. Remember these guys? I mean, these cows just eat grass. Oh, yes, but mm. we are trying to... Grass do that everybody wants to, to get rid of. We are trying to of. discourage open grazing. So it's closed grazing. They have a ranch, okay, and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, maybe generally That's speaking. why I said I don't want to go political. We don't want to because go political. Because, see, my view, when people are screaming about uh, the cows are, cows are eating our food, eating our... I'm like, okay, fine. Then let's uh, let's turn into America and have more cancer cases, you know. As long as you do not allow them, as long as you confine them in one field and give them, you see, they, they can't get enough food from that one field. You start giving them artificial food. 
then the, the number of cancer cases will increase in Nigeria. That is the truth. Okay, so is there no way to produce the grass from wherever and bring it to them where they are well, without I, I leave that to the government to think about because I travel from Lagos to Ibadan okay. and what I'm seeing is different. I'm looking at... I'm looking at bush, lush I'm green. looking at yeah. lush green, yeah. and I'm thinking that why can't government come and harvest and, you know, give these cows to eat? Yeah. It's very important. Okay. Still on the issue of pesticide, um, regarding beans specifically, mm -hmm. um, a few years ago we began to hear that Farmers use pesticides on their produce and especially beans that because of what they use, the beans do not have weevils anymore. How much beans should we be eating when you're talking about farm to table? Because beans is one of the good stuff we're supposed to be eating. But now we've been told that they've been treated one kind, two kind, <laughs> and we should run away from them. Thank you very much. You see, on this issue of beans, hmm. it's a big problem. Hmm. A big problem in the sense that I'm having to tell patients now that you need to find a way to wash off these pesticides because it is a big problem. I've had some patients eat beans and they can't go to the toilet. They have constipation. I have, I have had beans and I've thrown up several times. See. So um, I try to tell them because, you see, I, I don't eat the normal beans that everybody eats everywhere. You know, I, I, I found out about the... Uh, there's one Ibile beans. It's, uh, it's uh, called Ewaibiji. Ah, the black ones. Yes, the black ones. And the, um, they are pesticide-free. Because weevils don't affect them. They don't attack them anyway. True, true. So, and mm. you don't get a lot of it around. So, because I have done my own research, and now that I'm coming on TV, I'm sure everybody will go and start looking for it. <laughs> and then someone like me won't get it to buy anymore. It will become expensive. <laughs> So that's my own secret. Ah, okay. So I stock it a lot. Once it's out, it's, all, it's, it's usually out once a year. I'm not going to say it that one. <laughs> so that I can pre uh, Don't blame me. I have to keep eating it. Don't worry, we'll talk about it. Okay, time. off camera. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have just about two minutes. Mm -hmm. There are young people who have parents, whose parents are watching right now. And they want to try to protect the children from having or falling victim of certain ailments in the years to come. Mm. They have fallen victim of those things and they're watching from various parts of the country at this moment. What are your recommendations for them? We get the farm to table thing. It's going to be quite a marathon for people to tra make that transition. So um, having this conversation starts the, the whole process for them. But what should they be telling and teaching and taking the children through as they build up to their own future. Teaching them how to cook, eat less sugar. Um, yeah. Any pay? Yeah. Eat less sugar. Teaching them how to cook, how to cook. Cooking is very important. If you cook more in your house, you control what, what you goes eat. In, well, yeah. Exactly. What goes in your food. Yes. It's very important. Oh. Okay. In terms of, okay, go ahead. No, 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 no. I'm just processing that. Mm. And it makes sense because you go to Mama Put, you don't know how much Ajinomoto she's putting in your food. MSG. Oh, oh you want to go there? You, what, oh, MSG, you just talked about MSG mm -hmm. now. Yeah. What does that mean? MSG is a, I don't have to say the no, meaning. No, don't, don't, but, don't it's, but the, the generic food thing. additive. Yes. It's, a, it's a food additive that uh, is found in seasonings. You know, um, people use it a lot to, uh, to enhance the taste of their cooking. I would say to change the taste of the cooking because I don't cook with it, and yet you get the taste of my cooking. And um, I will tell you, you know, a history of Maggi, um, the Maggi itself. Maggi was, uh, was discovered or was formulated many years ago 
um, by some man who decided to feed the less privileged people, his servants, his, uh, all these, uh, all his slaves, you know, to feed them with all these uh, flavorings because he couldn't give them meat, chicken, or anything to eat. And uh, of course, uh, he didn't care how much of the chemicals he was giving them. Mm -hmm. And it was actually destroying these people. And then how it became commercial and accepted by the whole world, honestly, nobody understands. Mm. The day I read it, I was like, oh my God, many people don't know this. This information is not out there. And yes, people are scrambling for it. Every enlightened person wants to use Maggie now. They, they don't want to Which use Which is not a generic word for your bouillon Exactly. Cube. Yeah. <laughs> For any kind of season. Yeah. Any well, is now he started it, and then so many are now, you know, coming up with it, manufacturing all these things, adding a lot of MSGs in it, and it is really hurting people. But they don't know how much. Some would even tell you, "Oh, I I use just a little bit of this MSG," and I ask them, "Have you ever had a little bit of poison before?" <laughs> poison is poison. Poison is poison. <laughs> Oh, you, you, it sounds like you just decided that today you want to bust so many people's theology about I'm food. I'm sorry. We have, uh, and I'm almost certain that we haven't even started, have we? No, we haven't. Oh, Christ. <laughs> well, for now, we have to stop where we are now. Uh, Bisola Kadiku, Dr. Bisola Kadiku is a naturopath, doctor of natural medicine and MD, Nature Can Fix You Clinic. Thank you so much. Thank for you. Time Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Our, a healthy mind about the food that we should be eating. <laughs> Enjoy this music, it's good for your soul. It's good food for your soul. Well, how about a look at the startup bill? You've heard that before. About four months ago, the Nigeria startup bill was presented at the National Assembly. Um, the Senate finally passed the bill during the week. Um, it seeks to uh, position the country's startup ecosystem as the leading uh, digital technology center in Africa. Let's have a conversation around that this morning with Emmanuel Paul, who is Managing Editor at TechPoint. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. As well as Tracy Okoro, who is State Adoption and Integration Lead. Thank you so much for your time. She joins us from Abuja. Marina, thank you. Well, I'm sure we, we've kept you waiting for a bit, but then you had to wait for that bill to be passed. So maybe it's just part <laughs> of the process. So <laughs> apologies about that. But how enthusiastic should Nigerians be about this? Uh, let me start with you, Tracy. Um, I think that we should be really excited as a country. It's a signal that we're thinking of the future and we are investing in the future and not just you know speaking about it but their collective actions have been you know sort of unleashed and the full regalia has also been put together just to make sure that the tech enabled ecosystem or you know the economy is fully supported to um, sort of reap the potentials of the future okay um so it's one thing for us to talk about it, another thing to um, position or take action to expedite it. Do you see that action, the foundation for that action laid already, or is it something we have to work on? Well, the full uh, process has been an amazing and interesting one in that it's not the, the usual process of you know following bills and having to run helter skelter there's been like a a collective effort so we call it like um a big tent initiative so which means that all stakeholders have come together to make sure that this works and i make bold to say that this bill is probably one of the fastest bills that has gone through from start to finish to be able to get to this point. And so I think that um, the work has been uh, done, right? The major work has been done, the foundation has been laid, and um, 
I, we, we look forward to you know going on with the same steam that we started up till implementation because implementation is key, engagement is key, collaboration is key at this point. Hmm. Well, Mr. Paul, are you as enthusiastic as uh, Tracy is? <sighs> okay, yeah. Uh... I'm a little bit enthusiastic about the start a of A little your, bit. A little bit. But it's with a healthy dose of skepticism. And I think... I don't know how many, how more, how, what dose of skepticism is healthy. <laughs> healthy enough to be excited about the possibilities that could come from having a startup bill, right? It's meant to drive innovation. It's meant to drive growth in Africa's or Nigeria's startup space, rather. Mm -hmm. But... The, there are some things that stick out to me, right? So if, if you go to the Nigerian Startup Bill website and you see all the partners from the government that are involved with uh, the production of the Startup Bill, you will see the Office of the President, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the uh, National Information Technology Development Agency as NIDA, but there's a notable absence in that list, and that is the Central Bank of Nigeria. I can't... How does the Central Bank of Nigeria fit into this startup bill? Because a majority of the issues we've had with regulations and policies, significant number of them have come from the CBN directed at fintech startups or uh, digital currency startups or crypto startups or startups playing in the FX space. Then another question is how does the startup bill coexist with the NIDA code of practice or the NIDA bill? which shook the tech ecosystem just a few months ago. So there's the NIDA bill, which had some very, very, very weird provisions. Such as? OK. Fees, fines, levies, in case you fail to meet some. Uh, OK, so there's a 1% fee to be able to, to contribute to the NIDA development fund. Every company is supposed to contribute to that fund. Let's say, and initially we had just telcos and banks and all of that, but with the updated NIDA bill, you are seeing provisions like e-commerce companies, internet-based companies, which are referring to startup. Then there's the NIDA code of practice, which seeks to regulate social media and how Nigeria has operated on the internet. So, the question I have is, how does the startup bill coexist with NIDA and the secretariat for the startup, uh, the council, which is the startup bill is supposed to uh, produce, the council for innovation, the secretariat will be at the NIDA headquarters. So that is where my concern is. But ideally, the startup bill is a very, very, very awesome and innovative process. And I would really commend all the stakeholders that have brought this to pass, right? It shows a step in the right direction, but there are existing laws that have not been addressed. There are laws like the Pioneer Incentive, which is supposed to give Pioneer startups to early stage businesses. What has been happening with that? Have we implemented that? Has any startup benefit for, benefited from the Pioneer Incentive? Uh, there's a VC, there's a law that supports VC. I'm just trying to remember the name. It was enacted in 2004 which is supposed to improve investment activities in Nigeria. So what has been happening with that? How about data protection? These companies are using technology. They are definitely going to be harvesting a lot of data from users. Do we have a clear and defined data protection law? So the startup bill in itself is a nice step in the right direction, but it's only the beginning. Mm. The other issues that I just mentioned, the other laws that are supposed to be supporting businesses need to be implemented. Then the occasional weird policy that seems to regulate how we use the internet, they need to be addressed. So that is where my skepticism is coming from. Emmanuel, I'm trying to wrap my head around what you said about the CBN. Yes. Um, okay, when you mentioned cryptocurrency, I understand that because startups, are not going to get money from the CBN. They're going to get money from the commercial banks. You didn't mention those at all. <laughs> the CBN is the regulator. So they're regulating how the banks deal with you. They're not regulating you per se, are they? So CBN actually regulates fintech startups. So the likes of Flutterwave, Paystack, 
they actually have to answer to the CBN. They need to get a payments license. Then we have a huge juggernaut like InterSwitch, who has been running for quite a while. Mm -hmm. They have a payment switch license. We have eTransact, a company that is listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. Those are companies that actually receive the regulations of the CBN. So when you hear fintech startups, it's not just the big banks. Oh, sorry, when you hear the CBN regulations, it's not just the big banks, but smaller companies. There's Piggyvest, the darling of several Gen Zs and millennials currently. They have a microfinance, they, they have to work with a microfinance bank to get a microfinance bank license if they need to. And there's Kuda Bank the bank of the free. They have a microfinance bank license. They are license. all regulated by the CBN. All regulated by the CBN. Okay. All right. L L Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but I, I'm, I'm sure Tracy would want to speak to some of those issues as well. Uh, being a founder of the Business Academy Africa and the State Adoption and Integration uh, Lead for the Nigeria Startup Bill. Those concerns most certainly, oh, you're smiling already. That's wonderful. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you have the yes, answers. Go ahead. I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited because I think we've had this um, conversation with Emmanuel before, but maybe we didn't exhaust all the um, questions that he, because I, I think he did reach out to find out a few of these things. So first and foremost, there is, a, like, we have, like, a massive amount of companies that are supporting this whole journey and we can't have all of them on the website. And this journey began with a lot of consultations and you know, a lot of meetings, focus group meetings, uh, stakeholder relations, regional you know, um, conversations, town hall meetings. And for one of those things, we had a lot of MDAs in the room of which CBN, DBN, a lot of these, you know, um, financial regulators were in the room and had a conversation. So just because we don't have these companies, you know, smack dab on the website does not mean that they're not involved and they're not being carried along. I like to always remind people this, that every time, you know, startups say, oh, we have an, a, a, an innovation and it's very disruptive, right? There, there are displacements. So for the government, they have a huge burden to handle that displacement. So for example, let's say payment system, fintechs. When fintechs come up, they make it easy for you and I to be able to make financial transactions. But we forget that that means that, that means loss of jobs for some people, right? That means that a lot of things will no longer be working the old way. So the, the uh, federal government has to be able to show that this, and this is why the Nigerian Startup Bill is taking the big tent approach. This big tent approach means that everybody is carried along, right? Just to make sure that you know what is going on and how it is going on and everybody is involved in the process. Now, um, Emmanuel mentioned, you know, NIDA, you know, code of um, content, uh, content creation, content moderation and the rest. Now, there are conversations currently going on. NIDA is having stakeholder conversations with different people. But because, you know, they're not going and, and you know, Founders are not necessarily, you know, very interested in, and I'm sorry to say this, to go to the nitty gritty, right, of these conversations, of even coming to meet the government halfway to say, all right, what is going on? How are things happening? What, how can we help? And explain these uh, processes, right? So there's always some sort of a lacuna of information and then you know sometimes we jump into these conclusions but there are currently stakeholder conversations going on that you know content moderation conversation and neither being the you know like the housing the um council doesn't necessarily mean that you know neither holds all the supreme power it just means that as an agency that would be supervising these things, it would overlook. And there are different members, different uh, uh, people who form up that council, which even civil society organizations are represented. So which means that the interest of the tech ecosystem, and this is not just uh, founders, these are the investors, these are the agencies, these are the regulators, these are even the consumers and the users. Their interests will all be considered and covered. And so I understand the healthy you know, skepticism that Emmanuel is talking about. 
Mahal. And it's, it's, it's very important. It's very important because it will help to keep us on our toes just to make sure that we are looking out for everybody that is involved in this process. Well, that, another question that comes readily to mind then uh, would be what the objectives are. It would seem like, well, from what both of you have said, the startup bill seems to be talking predominantly about the digital economy. Uh, is that correct? Oh, yes. It's the ultimate objective of the bill is to help foster uh, a healthy environment for tech-enabled um, startups. So basically for the uh, tech-enabled ecosystem. And like I mentioned, all the stakeholders involved. So starting from the founder who is, you know, creating a disruptive innovation to the investor who's coming to invest, to the user who's going to be using that product, to the regulator, right? We're just trying to create, the bill is just trying to create a, an enabling environment that allows everyone to thrive, right, without having to, you know, uh, clash at some point. So the bill is now in the process of being looked at um, and you all are over the moon about that <laughs> but how do you think that government can actually create an enabling environment for these startups to thrive okay um, so the startup bill is based on different pillars and these pillars were formed after extensive consultation, extensive needs assessment done with all stakeholders involved asking the question that you just asked, how can the government create an enabling environment, right? And so these pillars first was we need to have concise regulations. We need to know them so that, because if you do not know a law, then it's easy for you to break it. We need to be able to know what are the things that we're supposed to do or what are the rules that guide you in a, a particular ecosystem. Then we're talking about capacity building. We have a debt of talent. So we need to be able to create a, a, a system or an ecosystem that allows for upskilling and training, right? In such a way that we have a larger percentage of young people that are prepared for the jobs of now. And the jobs of now are the digital jobs. You know how we, we used to talk about the future of jobs being then? No, the future of jobs has yeah, yeah, finally come and tech is leading the pack, right? And so it's important for us to create an economy or a system that allows that our young people or people who are currently working in different sectors upskill themselves to be able to meet the you know, global best practices. We're also talking about funding. So Startups most typically will be looking for funding, you know, initial funding, seed funding to be able to, you know, help support them solve these particular problems. And, you know, entrepreneurs are very different people. Entrepreneurs are constantly looking for a way to solve problems and some of the largest problems, you know, in, in the world and in Africa and in Nigeria, as the case may be. So funding is key. You know, talent is key. And then... Um, I think the fourth one, I, I, I can't remember the fourth one, but I think that we have done a lot of work that allows, has allowed us to properly map out the uh, exact ways that the government can you know, help create a, a thriving ecosystem and enabling environment for tech-enabled startups. And that has been sort of looked at and captured in the bill. Well, Paul, uh, I, one of the natural questions there, I mean, if this is so open to so many people, right? There are many, many Nigerians who use technology. And there are countless adverts of uh, people on social, various social media platforms make money from WhatsApp, make money from Instagram, and all so those from, things. From working at home. Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, yes. So I'm wondering, do you think this bill captures those as well? Hmm. OK, that's, that's an interesting question, because uh, in, in the ambit of most laws that the government has created, it usually captures registered businesses in the country. So we have CAMA, the Finance Act. So for you to gain any of the incentives in the business or let's say a tax break or something, you usually have to be registered. But what you'd find is most of these guys, they just woke up one morning and say, oh, I have this idea, let's start something. And they start. And to be fair, a lot of people have been harmed by uh, such platforms. They say make, grow your 1,000 Naira to 10,000 Naira mm. in five days. Oh. So how this law 
should, should I think it should since it's part of the digital economy, but I'm not sure it directly addresses those guys in this current state. Mm. But I think that I'm, I'm one thing that makes the startup bill really, really interesting, it's, it creates an ambit for building on each layer. So there's a particular layer it's starting with, but there's room for you to just keep adding stuff. Mm. So I guess that's why the government is particularly interested in regulating how people use social media, the code of practice and all of that, content mm -hmm. moderation. I, in an ideal scenario, they should actually cover those kind of platforms. But for a startup bill, which is something that is directed at businesses that are focused on high growth, that are focused on solving a problem with a unique business model, and problems that are often overlooked, this is what it directly addresses. But for mm -hmm. A lot of people on social media say we have Instagram vendors and all of that. Uh, I think it should, but currently, it's from what I can see, it's mm -hmm. going to improve from there. It sounds to me like uh, one of those um, landmines that people need to be careful to, uh, to avoid, right? Mm -hmm. So are there other areas of this law, other aspects of this law, this proposition, this bill, that government needs to give a little more attention to and people should not ignore because it's so easy. I mean, come on, it's a law. Who wants to read? <laughs> you know, nobody, generally, people don't like to read and that's probably where you know, some of these vulnerabilities show up. So what are some of the things that you think people need to be aware of before this bill becomes a law? Issues that need to be raised. You've raised some and uh, gladden, gladdens my heart that uh, Ms. Okoro has attended to them. So what are some of these things that you think people need to be aware of just before the bill is passed into law so that you know, they, can, they can be careful and if they need to be discussed now, discussed. Hmm. Okay, so for the current startup bill, what I think should stand out to most people, let's start from the positive side. If you're a young person and you're aspiring to start a business, I think you should actually understand what the startup bill entails and how it can benefit you. So if you're looking for, you're struggling to look for funds to start up your business, the provisions of this bill should actually direct you or point you in the right direction. Say you want to raise money, you want to learn from mentors, people who have done this business before you. Those, that's, those are some of the positive provisions of the startup bill, right? Then something we need to look out for, which is the concerns about data, data protection. We use a lot of these social media platforms and not to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but the amount of data these guys have on us is really, really, they, they can, they can treat, they know where you are, they know where you visited. So if you're using a fintech platform, for example, how this fintech handles your data, let's say you're using a CUDA bank or a piggy vest. So you should be able to know that, okay, your money is safe and they're not selling your data to third party uh, advertisers or uh, we've seen recently with some Nigerian government websites or platforms where they publish uh, people's data on the platform and the, the, the data gets to some certain corners of the internet that it shouldn't get to. So those are some of the interesting things I think we should watch out for. But generally, the startup bill itself, we should be, the most important thing is you should know that this is what you are entitled to as a small business owner, as a young founder, okay. and you should be able to leverage it. Then you should be able to notice those gray areas concerning data, those gray areas concerning implementation. You should know that, okay, this law, how does it affect my business? Okay. And how does it affect the other laws that have come up before let, now? Let me, let me ask you quickly. Since it's a startup bill, startup means that you originate something. Does, it have it, does the law have any protection for your copyright? Is yes. Is there any way in which, you know, I mean, if I start it, it's mine, and whatever is going to be built on it, I still maintain my, my, my ownership copyright, so to speak. 
Yeah, so those, those are some of the interesting points, right? Copyright, patent, those are things that most Nigerian startup founders don't even take seriously okay. most of the time. So yeah, that is uh, an interesting point. And I don't think it's one of the more finely developed aspects of the startup bill currently, but we already have the Copyright Act in Nigeria. And that needs to be updated, but what the startup bill is doing is it needs to harmonize all of these laws and bring it together okay. in one place. Mm -hmm. And it's a developing process that doesn't end. Okay. Okay. Tracy, let me take you somewhere entirely different. Um, a startup uh, will qualify as a small or medium scale enterprise. Am I correct? Am I right? Um, well, Yes, well, in some places, you know, yes, that would, that would suffice for. But in other terms, like in the tech ecosystem, we call startups uh, disruptors. So people who have created innovative um, products and services that have sort of disrupted the market. So, for example, let's, um, if I were to mention a startup, I would say uh, maybe Flutterwave, right, maybe Paystack. But... In the basic uh, uh, term for the NSB, it just means like a small business that is currently leveraging technology. Is um, a policy uh, or a guideline from government that banks should devote X number, X percentage of their profits to small and medium scale enterprises. So would you be accessing those funds do you qualify to access those funds? As a startup, is, is that what you're asking? And, um, would you qualify as a small or medium scale enterprise to, so that you can access those funds which government has asked commercial banks to set aside? I'm trying to understand. Are you asking if I or if a startup personally, would qualify? Not personally, uh, startups. Startups. Okay. <laughs> Well, under the Nigerian Startup Bill, there are processes and procedures uh, that would allow startups to be able to access you know, funding. And these are the things that would happen during implementation. And I'm happy that you led us into this. So the Senate has passed it. We're waiting for concurrence. But while we're doing that, we have the state adoption in full force. Because um, my NSB lead would say that when you listen to big companies, they speak about how their companies started in their garage, right? But here in Nigeria, we really don't have garages. What we have are our local communities and our states. And that's where these startups will come from. That's where they will originate from. And so it's important that the, every state has a bill, right, that also interprets or sort of seeks to uh, take away from the gains of the Nigerian startup bill, which from a federal level, uh, incorporating the nuances and the context of the state, aligning it with the vision of the state towards you know, entrepreneurship and economic sustainability, and build an environment where startups feel free from anywhere in the country, from anywhere in Africa, they can build and be supported. So, like I said, there are four pillars, and we're talking about you know, infrastructure, there's funding, there's talent and capital development, right? And then there's regulation. So under infrastructure and under uh, capital, where, and during implementation, there will be specific programs that will be put aside where startups can either now apply and they get accelerated or incubated so they, they learn, they're upskilled, and then they can access funding. Well, we don't have garages, but we have rooms. Those guys who had to start with garages had to use big equipment. Now, we can just start in your room with this. <laughs> So yes, let's say I have garages in our homes. Thank you so much, Tracy Okoro, who is founder of Business Academy Africa, as well as State Adoption and Integration Lead for the NSB. Thank you so much for your time, as well as Emmanuel yes. Paul, who Thank is you. Managing Editor, Tech Point. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Truly appreciate you being here. <laughs> Well, um, Those two people, I'm sure know. you have guessed. No, no, no. You, you, you may think it's Lagbaja. <laughs> no, it's not Lagbaja. It's the other one. It's the other one. The Elei. Elei of Lagos. The Elei of music. The Elei of music is with us this morning. Yinka Davis herself. 
jazz singer, actress, sculptor. What else? Yeah, we'll bring you a little more. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because if you've encountered this lady before, you'll know that she's a bit. She's got one, one or uh, more than one screw loose. So, don't be surprised. Are you agree? Sir, so for big time. Ah uh ah. -uh. Yeah? You don't question such by elegance, elegance, <laughs> elegance. <laughs> now she's singing of me, to me, at me. In your very before. Ah, it's not intentional. <laughs> Never. Good morning, Yinka. Yes, Good to have you morning, with us again. Morning, sir. <laughs> All right, sir. It was my birthday last week. Happy birthday, a my dear. A week ago. A week ago. Exactly. Happy, happy birthday. birthday. Last week, Saturday. Ah, blast. Mm. Nonsense and ingredients. I had a ball. Yes, where were we? What was the question? Now I'm back. I'm back. Sunrise. Hey, hey. We have come. <laughs> we have arrived. <laughs> Where's the question? What the question you forgot to ask me the last time? Now you're looking at me now. Oh. I'm not. Hmm. Okay. Well, what did I? We should just play. Please, when not I the picture. Her, what did I say? <laughs> we should just press play. So that's good. <laughs> carry go. Carry go. Lie, lie, yeah. Every question. Yeah. Carry go. Okay. All the question of this life. You call me a lady of Nigeria. I love it. I receive it. Mwah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Yeah, a lady of Nigeria, Claude Fair. No, a lady of music, like the. Eh, but when no one in Nigeria, no one, Claude, Chumfi, eh, in Nigeria, see, of music, Nigeria dot com. Ah, come on, man, I want to call that football. You know, Inka, Inka, you have been quiet. What have you been up to? What are you cooking? I I actually uh, went on a course briefly. Interesting. What did you go to study? Egg by me. <laughs> 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 and I did a little bit of academy. Only me wuni. I mean, my brain was on the left. My brain was on the right. Is that uh, awesome women academy? Something like that. Uh, awesome. Or something like that. Away. A W E uh, for women. It's women uh, to be gender. No, no gender awesome specific. Awesome women empowerment. Or yes, something like, that. like to become. You know, come on, be responsible for for once in your life. <laughs> yes. So I did it. You, and don't, it was you, don't, you, don't, you don't sound convinced. No, I, because I'm not convinced. <laughs> <laughs> I went to school okay, and I was so wondering did the school pass through me or did I really on okay. that order? But it was what, good. What, what did you good. learn? It was good. It was a different um, approach to life where people that are serious are looking at a very funny human being. I'm wondering what am I doing? Because I'm asking what myself, what am I doing with them? And they're wondering, Auntie Yink! And they're calling me Auntie. I mean, come on now, come on, come on, man. Me, it's in Lewuto Tonya now. Come on. You know, but it was great. Uh, 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 women doing great things. Uh, name, name, what do you want to call it? Import and export women! Ah! I dropped my hat to Nigeria. Ah! People should forget it. Nigerian women. Ah, so in that's, the, that's the answer to your question. That's about the what answer to the question. Doing. I want to go and know them. I want to go and know the women. I have to go and know them first before I know what to do. I don't know what to do yet, but I like what I've done by going to school to go and look at the women and know what they are doing. Is that not a good answer? Okay. No. Okay. So uh, now that you have gone there and met the women, if you want to smile to the camera, you come. Oh God! Oh hi! <laughs> What, what do you want to do? I have a lot, you know, construction, name it, I don't know. I love to get back into some, like my hands be busy. Get you myself to into to... trousers and, you know, and get into boots and get into the field and build agriculture. Build? Oh, yeah. I've always loved Agbenimi. It's just that uh, music took me away for a while. Well. I love being a farmer. So I met quite a bit of them. So I, I, a lot of things. I just don't want to get too much, you know, too much cooks. Uh, too many cooks spoil the broth, but that's not the point here. I'm just... You, before you go on to your farming thing, talk to this music clip you and uh, Labaja did. Oh, that. Uh-oh. Yes, I uh -oh. got the license. You know, because, you know, we, we, um, um, the producer called us to record 
The Colors, The Colors album, mm. The Color of Rhythm, I remember the name, I love the name, uh, did, uh, did, Onyi, uh, Onyi Momo, did, uh, that song that uh, Dizzy Kepalala did that time for a while, uh, Dance Africa. And it was fun. I was having a ball. Then I did Shekhar Oshik for a while. That was when they introduced Lagbaja. But we were yet to meet him because we were still working with the other producers and cool. Well, before you know it, this particular song I was told to, to, to record it, but I didn't release it. Never far away. So we, I, I did it, and I have my own copy. I mean, but not like they have, they have, they have to give it to me, but it go now to it over. <laughs> Nonsense. <laughs> me, I just tell them, look, I have license to sing the song, bro. Because if we go and know, all of us, me, everybody, but call it Maya, and then it go. It go, you know I love you, Mika. But you see, in this matter, I will sing it, whether I like it or not. But who is quarreling with you, Abbasi? I wonder. <laughs> I walk, I, can I quarrel with myself? Body. Is it not myself that I have to do myself myself? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I okay. did it. Now, let's go back to this, your farming. Yeah. So, where do you want to do this farming, please? Oh, well, obviously, I have to come to your end. Wait, where's where, my yeah, end? I, this, your side of the divide. Really? Where are the farmlands in this area, please? This place is quite delicate, which has have to kind of, you know, check the soils and everything. Ah, me, I'm ready for you people. What, what ready do you want with planting? I love everything. I love everything. You I can't plant everything, produce. obviously. I love everything. So, do what's, rice what is your also, But I need to speak with some of this. Um, Can you do place. rice in Lagos State? We have to find a way to do it. We have to find a way to do it. Lagos is too, <laughs> Lagos is too congested. Yeah, let, let's, say, let's stay in your Lin. music. And, uh, what's you? What? We, yeah, do people ask me a question? Uh, calm down, calm down. Let's stay in your... Music, acting, the, the entertainment right, industry for right, a while. Right. What for you are some of the issues that you think, as the industry is growing with so many talents growing up, are not being looked at now? I, I saw this docu series by Ayoshana. I don't know if you saw it. Oh no. Afrobeats. Oh, uh, I was part of that. Oh, okay. I think I was in. in Afrobeats with the S. Uh, I don't know. Uh, okay. Oh, because there's a difference between Afrobeat and yes, Afrobeat. In fact, in the, in, yeah. the, in the documentary, it, it was said so many times, Afrobeat with the S. Yes. Ah, they kept saying, okay, yeah. that means that's not the one for uh, Obiasika. No, I don't. That okay, well, so. Obiasika is in this one that means well. that, that's, that must have been the one, because he called me yeah. uh, the great Obiasika. Big up, sir. You know, yeah. so he called me to interview, to, to ask questions about the sound, the Nigerian sound. And yeah. I thought it was quite, um, yes. So what did I also, could I no, ask no, you? The, the, some, for me, I think the, the uh, documentary was actually looking at a name, a generic name, like hip hop or, or pop or reggae, a name for the Nigerian sound or African music sound. Well, like I like I'm still telling myself the truth. Baba Fela owns Afrobeat. Mm -hmm. Without he did, the he S. did not give us Afrobeat. He played Afrobeat. Mm -hmm. Now there was Orlando Orlando Julius. Julius. Orlando Julius. He was Afro. They were doing Afro soul. Yeah. You know? Afro soul. Um ah, you can't, can you remember those old stars? Which one of them? Name? Uh, let, me, let me just calm down. There was Not the Babaraba. Sisters. Babaraba was food uh, juju. Mm. There was Babaraba. the Lijadu sisters. Lijadu well. sisters. They were not even Afro. Mm. They were just pop. They were like a different kind of pop coming out, like, yeah. like a contemporary kind of music. Mm. Dorai Fudu, uh, 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 Ha. Oh my God, some great artists Nigeria had. Oh, yeah, great, great. And Auntie Onyeka, when God bless her, Auntie Onyeka, that did just fine. Christian, Christian, look, they, they were, they were, they were, they were, they were more. Davis, yes. Fumi Davis, that is the. Oh, to bad da ra ko ra fo mo re. Oh, to bad da ra ko ra fo mo re. I'm singing like Auntie Fumi now. Oh, okay, sorry. Can't I sing like Auntie Fumi? I, I didn't. Okay, sorry. <laughs> 
um, so uh, these were great artists. Uh, I, I mentioned this again, like Palala, Terracotta, you know, uh, remember, the, tell Cotier. me if you know the city called Sodo. Uh, yes, yes, yes. That's Terracotta. Terracotta yeah. yeah, Tony Okoroji. Even Tony Okoroji said, we to do yeah. small party Chris now. Mba, do, Chris, yes, these were contemporary Nigerian artists, like Nigerian artists, but no Nigerian sound. Hmm. Afrobeat is fella, because he, he's, he's commandeered it. Hmm. Now, if we want to call our music Afrobeat because we want to support our Baba, that's all right. Only but with the yes. But no, 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 forget it. They should forget the yes. Is it that it's Afrobeat or it's not? Reason? No, no, but Afrobeat is a genre on its own. On its own. It? Yes. But I agree. But he's talking about Afrobeats. All beats. kinds of beats. They have come. <laughs> No, what is it? Leave, it's not the same way that the, uh, they went to go and adopt the name Hollywood to Nollywood. What's that? Why do we have to? Can we, can we just stop follow, 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 fo stop following? Lead or be distinguished in something. Yeah, well, I don't know what else to say to you. I believe that we can do something right and do it. With except, I mean, ex well, no exception to the rule. But I'm not saying you should not follow, but follow with sense. If you would propose a generic, because I, I'm, I'm asking because first you are an, you are an institution in the industry, and then secondly because I mean <laughs> it's a conversation that, that is going on, <laughs> right? So, if you would consider, if you would suggest a name to consider or names to consider for a generic name for the African sound or music what would it be is this you know, something you know my about? first my first my first concern is who we are as a people the people the brazilians the people the cubans the blacks that left this shore did not know the name yoruba they know the name olukume now that is a name. olukume olukume Olukumi in Shakiri means my friend. But in the Leyoba, Ara Alumi. Yeah. Ah, Every, nobody, nobody has actually sat down to say, what is it? Where did the name Yoruba come from? Because there's nothing in the language of Yoruba that will give you the name Yoruba. Except Karo Jiri. <laughs> so Yoruba. what exactly, who are we as a people? When the person of the East, they know who they, they tell you Ndigo, they know themselves. They, they will give you instances, they will give you their dosia, modus operandi. Now, when the West will give you Agidigbo, the West will give you Akpala, the West will give you Waro. Fuji. Excuse me, meaning there is no high life in the style. High life, I understand, was adopted. Ghana. Yeah. And it was adopted. We still dance it till tomorrow. But then when we go to the villages, we'll be hearing some serious pop. <laughs> the timing and the rhythm is different. Man, have you been to Judeoba? Have you heard? Do you hear her like that? So exactly. What is? So there's so many pockets of all sorts of pot puree. All sorts. Mm. Now, until we now decide, okay, we have a sound. Until then, we are still having fun. Let it be S and X and another X and Z. It's all right. That's what it is. But, <laughs> but you, 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 you raised a, a critical issue, and I'd like you to contemporize it. If that I can is use a that delicate term. matter, sir. Yeah. I am not the one in charge. No. Of this <laughs> okay, so you talked ah, about you talked you. about uh, Ojudeobab sound and all those cultural sounds, and oh that's good. Oh in fact. God. Part of that, uh, I don't know why I'm even making this an issue, but there, there is the generic five-beat pattern in our music. Now, that was largely spoken about in that, you know, this, in the uh, Afrobeat. this documentary. Oh, that's awesome. And I like to see it. Largely spoken about, actually. And it's in every, no matter how local or no matter how contemporary the sound is, you are likely to find that five-beat pattern. Wow. In that music, in wow. our music in Africa, I mean, it, it's something that is all over the place. So, beautiful. If we, uh, but the, uh, I'm I'm talking about the way, uh, you know, music has evolved. Yes. Now, mm. from that part, I was, for instance, amazed and pleasantly so to find that Waro has entered contemporary pop. It has to. 
It has to. It's us. It's us. Waro is blues. Period. Don't oh. try to make it any kind of color. Fee. It is blues. Colossus. Ladies and gentlemen, traditional jazz blues is Waro. <laughs> Let nobody deceive you. It's as simple as M, B, C. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> it's, that's, it's serious. Let's be sincere. Okay. Did you, uh, you know, I don't know who gave us all those, uh, way, 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 way. oh my God, that's those kind sakara. of molo, molo sakara. Yeah. Where did they get it from? But that sound came, I think, more from the north. Yes. The sounds of uh, Dan Maria. Dan Maria. Uh, Dan Maria. Haji uh, Yes. Oh, Maman Shata. Yes. Maman Shata. Yes. My God, we are too incredible. What kind of a country is this? That you have incredible people. Too what? much. Too much. Do you know that Kwame Nkrumah was the one that made Ghana great? Because he accepted a appreciated the sound that came from Ghana. The high life. Now. And spread all and over. And spread, and he would sit with his people, doll, do all sorts of love with his people. The people were united by their sound. Till today, they call hip life. They change it to hip life. They still love it. Now the thing is, what are we doing about us? Do we have to wait for the government to do it? No. Can we do it? Yes. But are we willing to do it? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so who will take the lead? Do man. Well, I can, but uh, as long as people are ready to go mad. <laughs> are you ready to go crazy? Well, you're not crazy on this stage. Look at that sound. You're not crazy on the stage. Because I love us. I love Nigeria. Do you know how much I love... Uh, uh, I told you... Um, what, which, where's this? Which, which performance is this, man? Oh, that's a uh, Freedom Park with, um, oh my God, Lord, uh, Bantu. I didn't Bantu called me to come perform. So his band, and I, it doesn't happen often, but I haven't even seen Ade in a long time. Ade Bantu. Love you, love you, love you, baby. Let's talk about you for it, for the next uh, one minute, 50 seconds. Um, so, well, I never began by asking you, where Mommy. have you been? Okay, now, where are you going from here? I've been to London to see the Queen. But no, you went to see going the to... King. Okay. But, but when they got, you got there, you found out that they don't have a king, they have a coin. So you came back. So where, where are you going They're telling me I'm 22,000 years old or 300 years old. Where are you? Oh, Look. No. Where am I? <coughs> right now, uh, I, I'm still, I, I'm having a ball. I'm working hard at reinventing which is very interesting. Reinventing is, because I love my, like I told you, I think I told the house what before, Ninth Mile. By the way? I wanted the sound from the East now. Mm -hmm. I want it, I want it. Okay. Do you know how hemmed in those people are? They're just, how many people? And they are, they're like ants. Oh, oh, oh. Oh yeah, mama, Hey! I love those people. I just want a bit of them for an album, Ninth Mile. Is that, is that not by the Oriental Brothers? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How about the Peacock organization? I love, I love them too, but you know, I like the, there's some things, the quack, quack, quack thing. There's a sound. They have a sound. I want their sound. Add that to my rep, uh, you know, my resume, my pattern. So that's do that that's what you're working on now. Yes. But they don't like me now. They don't want to give me their language. I don't know what is my... What, am I too black? Am I yeah. too short? What is it now? When I talk you to learn me now, it. They don't give it to you. You learn it. Well, um, I can tell you that if we stay here for too long, we think we're not going to close this show we, we too are going to lose a few screws. <laughs> Yinka Davis, sculptor, actress, singer. And she's pronounced. still singing. Yeah! Give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. I'm farmer to be. No, she's a farmer already. Thank you I'm very much already. for joining us this morning. <laughs> I love you, mommy. I love you forever. We wish you I love you, all... Nigeria. We I wish... love Nigeria. We wish you all the best. Yes, happy birthday to me. Mwah. Happy Thank birthday you. to you. It's belated though, but happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs>
So that closes a rather crazy edition of Sunrise. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for staying with us. We will see you next week. My name is Alero Hidi. <laughs> and I'm Ayomaki Day. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your weekend. Happy birthday again. Just, you know. I'm spoiling my face. It's not my fault. That works. <laughs>